I've never had on today. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the January 24th, 2023 meeting, 2024 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. All members are present except Laura. Um, we also have staff Aaron Jock and Dave Zomek here tonight. Um, we're starting off with chair report. I have nothing today, so I'll give it over to Dave. Go ahead, Dave. Wow, that was fast. Um, <laughs> I'm still writing down a few notes. Um, real quickly, just a couple of up updates for the commission. Um, we do have bids due for the trail work at uh, Hickory Ridge. Uh, they're due next week. So um, yeah, I believe they're due next week. So it should be exciting to get those in. Um, Let's see, Aaron and I are planning to submit, speaking of Hickory Trails, as you know, um, the, the uh, park grant and the CDBG money will not fund all of the trail work at Hickory Ridge. Although you've permitted um, the, the trail work there, we don't have funds for all of it. So uh, DCR, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, uh, just came out a couple of weeks ago with their um, grant announcement. So we are planning to submit a grant for uh, some of the other trails at uh, Hickory Ridge. So uh, Aaron and I will be pulling that together in the next couple of days. It's due February 1st, I believe. So uh, that'll be a race to the finish line on that. I had a good meeting. I attended a meeting with Bruce this morning of the Fort River Watershed Association. Perhaps Bruce might say more about this later, but from the town standpoint, I think uh, 2024, 25, 26, um, our work in conservation as well as um, our collaborative work with DPW, there's going to be a lot of focus on culverts. There's there's quite a bit of money out there in, uh, in municipal vulnerability uh, funding, in hazard mitigation funding, et cetera, et cetera. So our goal, uh, Aaron, myself, working with Amy Rizeki and Beth Wilson and DPW will be, you know, to try to get as much funding as we possibly can to address some of these uh, under underperforming culverts. And DPW's got um, a couple um, beginning to be teed up and they, you know, will eventually uh, be coming to the commission through the permitting process. So, you know, places like the low areas of West Pomeroy Lane, Potwine, Pomeroy, and the list goes on and on. There's a lot of these culverts that have been in the ground and in the water for 50, 60 years plus. And they're, a lot of them are, you know, um, rusted out, caved in, beaver damaged, et cetera. So uh, there's, there, we're going to try to chase all the funding we can to get rid of these and, and get them out. And, and then of course, we have to meet the stream standards when we when we go to 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 put things back. So it means often means you know box culverts or bridges. So uh, it'll be challenging to do, but um, DPW is in the in the hunt for funding, and we'll we'll be right there with them. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention to you is that Aaron and I um, have be been talking with a consultant um, group. Uh, Fustin O'Neill about some exciting visioning for Puffer's Pond and the future of Puffer's Pond. As you know, we've really suffered up there the last couple of years with water quality issues. We have some, some challenges with the dike at Puffer's, the dam at Puffer's, and we all know that Puffer's, if we want to keep that resource as a as a, an open water resource, we either have to dredge it or not. Um, but if we want to keep it as a pond, um, it's filling in pretty rapidly. So we'll have more on this, you know, in the coming next couple of months. Um, I hope to be able to take some time during one of your upcoming meetings. Uh, we have a nice PowerPoint going on some of the ideas we have um, at least begun to think about at Puffer's Pond. How do we address beach erosion, uh, uh, um, um, deposition from the Cushman Brook, filling in the the uh, the pond, trail trail issues, accessibility issues, uh, parking, uh, you name it. So we're looking at kind of a comprehensive plan to try to address those over time. 
So we'll we'll be bringing that to you in the coming uh, next probably um, 45 days. So those are just some of the updates uh, around town. A lot of a lot of work going on kind of behind the scenes and uh, we'll we'll gear up for spring summer uh, projects in 24 and 25. Thanks, Dave. See your hand up, Alex. Go ahead. Dave, uh, on the water pollution, you had talked about getting together with UMass or somebody to try and track down uh, whether or not there's uh, problems up Cushman Brook that um, uh, faulty septic systems or something. Is there any movement on that? Um, we're actually, we have a meeting coming up. It's either later this week or next week where we're meeting with um, a professor from the university who specializes in water quality. And he's been, he and his students have been looking at the, the Mill River below Puffer Spawn, particularly in the Hadley Reach. Um, and we're going to see if we can work with him or, or twist his arm a little bit to help us out with Puffer Spawn and Cushman Brook. Uh, I do have a little funding in a in a few accounts that I might be able to redirect a little bit to some water uh, quality sample sampling upstream. Uh, we we did some years ago and really didn't find all that much. So I guess the short answer, Alex, is yes, we're beginning to look at that because we in the last couple of years we've lost so many swim swimmable days at puffers that it's it's really um, it's kind of uh, you know, uh, getting to the point where we need to do something there. Um, so we'll we'll begin that work in February, March. Go ahead. Um, well, just to follow up on that, I talked to a water researcher at UMass, probably knows and is affiliated with the researcher that you're going to meet with and um, talk to him about maybe getting students involved in upstream monitoring and um, he sounded very positive about making that happen. So maybe we could touch base offline about it just before sure. I forget. Go ahead, Jason. Be, might be the same. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, Dave, you mentioned some funding for old culverts and things like that. Um, is this, is are we getting any funding from like, uh, like the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act? Are we writing grants for is anyone writing grants to try to get um any money for that and then also we had briefly touched on the ms4 permit and uh what was going on previously um any and it's somewhat apropos since we have two sanitary sewer overflows um any talk about like green stormwater infrastructure things like that to aid in water quality for the entirety of the town you know not just like at puffer's pond but uh you know maybe that's a good place to start yeah maybe aaron can address some of the sources of the, of the funding for culverts but your second question on ms4 um jason um what i know is is i think we're and Aaron may be able to comment on this too, but we're in the fairly early stages of, of data collection on that. I think I think DPW is taking the lead on that, not the conservation department. So it really originates with Beth Wilson and Jason Skeels and um, Amy Rusecki. Um, but I think we're, you know, we're moving at some pace. I, I didn't want to say slowly, but I think we're we're doing our due diligence on inventorying um you know what what is out there in terms of infrastructure along and and between and among all of our river uh, major rivers and tribs but there's not a i would say honestly there's not a, a comprehensive concerted effort to look at water quality townwide i think it's you know we're aaron and i are working with some groups looking at water quality in the fort river um, and likewise, we're initiating some new, uh, harder look at water in the Cushman Brook that feeds puffers. But there's no real comprehensive effort at this point to kind of coordinate all that. Go ahead, Aaron, if, if you want to jump in. So the DPW did get some funding um, 
and was selected to have a stormwater study done townwide, which there's actually a meeting for like a kickoff on Thursday for that. Um, it's with the assistance of also with Fuss and O'Neill, I believe. Um, and that's um, sort of somewhat of a comprehensive look at our stormwater and, and that um, Dave is correct with the MS4 stuff. There's not really like a dedicated uh, staff available to do that, but I know that DPW has been relying a lot on interns. I know that some of the staff funding uh, or that some of the federal funding from the um, infrastructure um, funding has been sort of in the realm of FEMA and the FEMA funding, unfortunately, has been limited by or the town's ability to apply for it has been limited by the fact that we don't currently have a hazard mitigation plan but the the fire department did recently get funding um, from a grant for us to update our hazard mitigation plan and so once and that's being kicked off soon from what i understand the planning for the hazard mitigation plan so once the hazard mitigation plan is in place it will open up opportunities for us to get more federal funding but there are some limitations right now because of because we don't have an approved plan. Thanks, Erin. More on that later, I guess. All right. Um, move on to minutes. Do we have minutes? Um, so I was not able to review the draft minutes this week just because I've had a lot of meetings. Um no worries. but we'll we'll kick those to next week and we'll have probably three sets to approve next week because okay. we have a set from Aaron uh, that they finished before they wrapped up. Um, and then um, presumably we'll have two sets um, from the previous meetings. So we'll try to catch up next okay. next meeting. And I think I see Bruce writing. So thank you, Bruce, for taking yes, minutes. Yes, thank you, Bruce. <laughs> um, land management updates, uh, the Open Space and Recreation Plan Survey. Aaron, do you want to give us an update on that one? Yeah, so um, so we're staff are at sort of like the semifinal draft phase of the open space and recreation plan survey. I did circulate it to commissioners um, last week. If anybody has comments, please get those to me as soon as you possibly can. The um, target date for releasing that is February first. Um, staff is planning a mid-February sort of information session, which the Conservation Commission will be invited to attend, basically like giving a rundown of what staff have done uh, relative to the development of the open space and recreation plan thus far, um, some information that we're looking to um, gather from the survey, and just taking any um, public comments or input on the process uh, to guide sort of our plan development. Um, so I'll keep you guys updated. Um, it's actually, I think we're aiming for February 15th at noon. Um, and our next meeting is on February 14th. I'll keep you guys informed over email um, as things develop and it gets planned, but just to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And how will it be distributed to the public? Um, so it, uh, the, the survey? Yes. Um, so the survey will be partially on the town's Dave, remind me what the um, name of the program is the town uses. Engage Amherst, is it? Okay, Engage Amherst, which is like a sort of a, a, on the town website. It's a um, a, a, commu a, a um, how to, crowdsourcing sort of software where you can do um, surveys and it, it harnesses that information to give us all kind of metrics of what the responses are. And then I believe there's also an opportunity for, for folks who don't have access to um, completed online, there'll be a paper survey. And also for members of the community who want to participate but um, need translation services, there's going to be an option for that as well. So um, there should be like, a, I think, a phone number to call for access to translation services. So that's an option. The phone number is accessible on the website or how, how are people going to be generally informed that it's yeah. available? So I think on the Engage Amherst, if people need translation services, the um, the town software is able to actually translate the survey into various languages. But if people um, are wanting to complete it um, with assistance or um, with a translated version of the paper survey, then there's a number to call and in various languages at the top of the paper survey. So 
um, people can, uh, it's basically says in multiple languages, if you need assistance translating this language, call this number, but it's written out in all the different languages so people can, can um, gain access if they need to, to reach out for help. Thanks. Go ahead, Jason. Sorry, you're talking about the uh, Town of Amherst Open Space and Rec Plan Survey? Yes. Oh, OK. It has a QR code. It says there's going to be a QR code there? Yes. OK. Those and then are. how how would you like to receive comments? Do you want, like, a scan markup? That works. Uh, scan markup. Um, I think Michelle responded just with, like, email comments. Um, so either one is is welcome. OK. Hey, all good? All right, great. We'll move on to Kestrel Lane the Vegetation Maintenance. Um, so this is, do we have people here for this or are we just? Okay. Yes. Okay, I see Chris Co. So this is a private road. Um, my understanding is that generally this is routine maintenance that would be covered by like an OMP with DPW, but since it's private, we're being approached by the HOA. Correct. General culvert vegetation maintenance. Are you Correct. bringing in? Okay. Yep. And um and just so everybody knows, um I believe Kestrel Land or Kestrel Land Kestrel um Lane and um I don't know if Hot Brook as well, but there's there's a couple roads down off of Old Farms Road which are private roads, um and so the maintenance responsibilities um, don't necessarily fall to the DPW. And so that's why um, these landowners are here tonight. Um, they're members of the Homeowners Association. Hi guys, welcome. Hi, thank you for the time. I'll try, we'll try to keep it brief. Um, I'll see if I can share my, try to share my screen. <clears throat> okay, I'll try that. Can you all see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, so we're residents of Kestrel Lane. We're in the Meadow subdivision, and we're um, we're proposing to do some clearing along Hopwick Road. There are um, the land is currently owned by the developer, which is Tofino, and the common areas are being maintained by the residents, the HOA. <laughs> and uh, we approached the HOA president, who suggested that we run it by the um, by you folks um, before we start any work. So we're looking to do some maintenance to keep the sidewalk clear um, along the head wall. Uh, I'll show you uh, an aerial view in a second. And um, there's a sidewalk and uh, we wanna remove vegetation from the head wall that tends to overgrow onto the sidewalk. And then we're also, there's there's two culverts that go under the road and they um, there's a lot of growth, uh, vegetation growth around those. So we wanna remove that. So this is the area in question. This is Kestrel Lane. This is Hopbrook, and um, there's a, the road crosses this um, uh, wetland, and there's two culverts that run under the road, and there's a head wall on either side of the road. This is an aerial view from 2004. Um, you can see there's no, no vegetation growing in the head wall. It's it's trap rock essentially. That it's fairly steep and it's trap rock, and now there's vegetation growing up through there. This is kind of a picture from the ground level. There's a sidewalk here. This vegetation grows over the sidewalk pretty much annually. And um, we've been, the residents have been trimming it back. We'd like to remove all this vegetation down to the ground um, in this, that grows up through this trap rock, trap rock. There's two culverts. This is the output side of the two culverts. You can't see them, but they're down, down here. And this is the inlet side. Um, these are the two culverts, and you can see there's a lot of vegetation growing around the um, the culvert. So that that's the area we want to we want to work on. Thanks. Um, is there any public comment on this? Raise your hand. I'm just going to keep an eye in the room. Um, any commissioner comments? Questions? I don't see any. When you say cut it down on the ground, do you mean cut it to the base of the plant or pull it out? That's my only question. Um, <clears throat> probably probably cut it down to the base. I think it would be difficult to pull it out unless there were smaller, some of the smaller vegetation we might be able to pull out. But it was, I think we'll probably just cut it down to the base and then we'll need to maintain it at that level because it'll probably continue to grow. 
Sounds good. Otherwise, it would be kind of disturbing the soil. Alex, I see your hand up. Would any herbicides be used, particularly around the wetland streams or no. pesticides? No. no, no manual. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Anybody else? Are we looking for a motion on this one or are we just approving? Um, I think I just wanted the commission to be notified on the record that the landowners were hoping to do this and also that this is an ongoing sort of operation maintenance activity that the homeowners association is looking to complete, you know, on an annual or semi annual basis to make sure that 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 those culverts aren't damaged and that the road is safe and passable and the sidewalk is safe and passable so mostly just to get it on the record that they've come, um, that they've notified you and that nobody has any objections to them taking care of this. Um, basically why they're here. If nobody has any problems with it, I I was, I am completely comfortable with it. And um, I think that they're fine to proceed. Great, thank you for coming to us with it and keeping us informed. We appreciate that. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, you guys, know, I should have asked, it just didn't occur to me at the time about beavers when you're down there pulling vegetation. From culverts, um, there may be that some of the culverts have beaver sticks and um, things that are in, impeding flow. Will you be removing them? Um, in the past, the HOA has, I think, employed beaver solutions, and they have done the removal of, um, of, of you know, they're the ones who have done uh, beaver maintenance. There's a small fence. Um, that they've installed at the inlet side to keep the beavers out, and um, you know, and, and they've they've been doing the maintenance. We're not anticipating, um, you know, needing to undo things. That they usually, what we do want to be able to do is be able to see um, into you know down into that area. So if we see beaver activity, we can contact, um, you know, contact somebody to 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 address the situation. So the short answer is no. <laughs> yeah, short answer is uh, not anticipated, no, yeah. Thank you. Um, just as a note, if this is ongoing, I wonder if we could talk about like a longer term OMP for this or like a longer management just because the beaver activity and the maintenance of the culvert should include the Conservation Commission notification. Um, but because we have some kind of standard operations plan with DPW, it seems like maybe we could work something out um, for this road too. Andre, go ahead. Just a quick question. Uh, how do you uh, plan to dispose of the uh, vegetation that you're cutting? Um, I think uh, the the president, uh, Doug, uh, we talked to him about it and he was going to truck it away um, and probably take it to the dump, I think. Right? Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Anybody so, else? Go ahead, Aaron. Um, just in terms of the, the beaver, uh, maintenance of beaver um, structures. So generally speaking, if there's beaver deceiver, flow control devices, um, or any um, uh, like the fencing that's installed around culverts to keep, um, you know, sticks from getting caught in the culvert and also keep beavers from blocking up the culverts. If those are installed, generally maintenance of those is something that is just um, standard practice. But if they're ever, if they ever fail and need replacement, or if um, new structures are needed, that's what would sort of trigger the CONCOM's involvement. But um, what might be helpful is if the homeowners association sort of wrote up what their operation and maintenance is um, on an annual basis with the you know, information about Beaver Solutions and that they have an ongoing maintenance contract to um, you know make regular repairs and or do annual cleanings and maintenance of the structures and also just your anticipated um, vegetation maintenance plan that includes information about where you're trucking the material to. Like even just a simple one page or an email might be helpful for you to send to the Conservation Commission. That way we have something on record that just notes that this is what you guys do on an annual basis to um, maintain the areas of the 
homeowners association owned and maintained areas until it's accepted by the town of Amherst. It might just be a way for you guys to feel more comfortable doing the maintenance you need to do and keep the conservation commission informed of what your plans are. We, we, yeah, we could certainly bring that to the, um, to the HOA. Great. Okay. I don't think we have any more questions about this. So you guys are good to go. Thank you Thank for you. coming again. Yep. Have Thank you morning. very much for taking the time. All right. What do we have for time? We have four minutes. I don't think we can really do anything in four minutes. <laughs> anyway, got a comment? Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Andre. You can notify folks if uh, of all the um, hearings that are going to be uh, postponed. Thank you. Um, let's see. If you're here tonight for Pure Sky Development on behalf of WD Coles, that will be continued. If you're here for SWCA on the for the University of Massachusetts for construction of the gravel parking lot. That's going to be continued. Wetland, Wendell Wetland Services on behalf of Kevin and Mary O'Brien for construction of a single family home on Leverett Road is also going to be continued. So if you're here for any of those, um, they are going to be continued to our next meeting, right, on February 14th. And just check back at the website for timing on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. The other thing, um, I haven't scheduled a site visit for um, the Trillium Way uh, enforcement order um, just because we've had snow cover and frozen conditions. And I feel like it's going to be important for the commission to get out there to actually see what's going on. Um, so I'll be monitoring uh, snow and you know temperatures to try to schedule a time when it'll be most um, effective for you guys to get out there and actually see the, the conditions. So just wanted to update you because I know you all requested a site visit at the last meeting, but it's been snow covered and um, probably not the, not the time to go out and view the violation. Mm -hmm. That may happen as likely as next week. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds good. Thanks, Erin. We can see how the erosion controls are working. Mm -hmm. um, with our two minutes before our first meeting, I'll just report that I think a number of commissioners and as well as Erin attended a MACC, so the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions, meeting tonight with an update of the new DEP um, regulation updates. And it was specifically focusing on climate resilience um, related updates to those. A lot of it was stormwater. Um, and how they're incorporating both, a lot of it was coastal, so um, not necessarily relevant, but some of it was how to incorporate rainfall measures, metrics. Um, interestingly, they're not using projected rainfall, they're using 90% um, quanti um, confidence intervals of current rainfall. So that was kind of a big discussion. Um, doesn't necessarily come to us except in our reviews of the stormwater um, what else? Um, they're taking public comment on it right now, and I think uh, we have some material that we could circulate. Things like, do we feel there's adequate protections for vernal pools, or um, sort of what the regulatory um, challenges are for conservation commissions in administering the new rules? I see your hand up, Bruce, so I, I believe you are there today. If you want to add anything, I think you're muted, though. Go, <laughs> go ahead. It was multitasking. Uh, when you're done. Um, I think it would be valuable for the commission to just review the things they're taking public comment on to the to the DEP. Um, they made a point about talking about the positive updates as well as the things that we think could be changed for the better. But anything that might frustrate you when you're reading through these regulations or sort of the the confluence of looking at that with our bylaws and the challenge of administrating these, um, they want to hear from us. And they're going to be submitting their own sort of collected comments. And I think there's a Google sheet by which we can include individual comments that they will review and incorporate into their bigger document. So we can find that and circulate it to the commission. Okay, go ahead, Bruce. Um, that's basically what I was going to say. Um, they didn't record the session. Oh. And they don't really know how to 
captured the chat, which had a lot of pretty fine grain technical stuff that people like Jason might be uh, capable of understanding. Mm -hmm. But but I think sending the slide deck and these other materials would be valuable. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. It was a good distillation of some of the sort of finer point updates to the DEP that specifically relate to the Conservation Commission and how we might sort of use them in our in our bi-monthly meetings. All right, um, it's 4.30, so unless anyone had any questions about that, we can move on to our first one. 7.30. Sorry, <laughs> Pacific time. <laughs> I did uh, just want to make one comment, if I could, about that um, presentation and, and uh, the changes. So um, we in Amherst already have a municipal stormwater bylaw, and some of the requirements for the changes that are coming in the um, updated regulations are focused on bringing the regulations into compliance with the federal MS4 regulations. Um, much of that has already been incorporated into our municipal stormwater bylaw. So, for example, the 90% TSS removal requirements, as well as the, I think it's 40% um, phosphorus requirements. And so I've already been reviewing um, the permits for compliance with those things, uh, with those elements of required that are required as part of the town plans. Um, and certainly I'll make sure that um, DPW is aware of the updated regulatory changes um, for their project planning. But um, I just wanted to make sure that the commission was aware that um, I am uh, um, aware of the updates and what the requirements are and that I have already been reviewing permits to make sure that they are meeting those requirements. So it's not going to change a whole lot in terms of how we're reviewing permits in Amherst. It'll change from, you know, some of the regulatory updates and stuff, but we've already been holding people to these standards. So just right. wanted to Thank make you. sure that I made that clear. I presumed that you were all totally on top of that. I think what I just want to take the takeaway is that there's an opportunity for public comment, I think, until yeah. March something first. So that's just what we'll follow up on with the commission. Okay, um, moving on. Stone, so this is our 7.30 notice of intent for Stonefield Engineering and Design LLC on behalf of the Valley Community Development for the construction of a 15 residential duplex structures and associated site work, including parking, utilities, stormwater management, and landscaping within the buffer zone at 20 to 40 Ball Lane, Map 5A, Lot 56. And we have C. Jessica Allen. If there's anybody else here, I see Josh Klein. and Lee. All right, um, there you guys are, welcome. Um, so I'm just, sorry, skipped ahead hearings. So our general procedure for fairness to all applicants, each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda. It's five minutes of comment from staff, five minutes of presentation or applicant. Representative, five minutes for public comment or two minutes per person, five minutes for conservation commissioners. And as of November 1st, the commission will be requiring all submitted and revised material to be submitted by Wednesday, the week prior to the meeting at close of business. Okay, moving on from that. Welcome everybody. We're gonna give Aaron the floor to give us a staff update. So um, the applicant provided a uh a batch of revised materials as of um, the 17th of January, which I've had the opportunity to review. And um, I'm satisfied that they have taken staff comments into consideration. Um, I've got everything teed up. Um, I dr did draft an order of conditions. Um, speaking offline with Michelle, I did add some additional um, invasive species management um, conditions to the permit. So in, at the bottom of the special conditions for commission members, you'll see um, some um, invasive species management con conditions, some conditions that are specific to the management plan on this site. Um, the other thing um, I just wanted to mention was that um, the applicant may have some updates for us regarding whether or not they want us to move on the project tonight. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that I preface with that. They are still before the Zoning Board of Appeals, and so there may be some additional um, 
you know, plan adjustments that they're making, um, in which case, uh, you know, I'll let them make the decision as how they want to proceed with that, but I just wanted to make sure the commission was aware. Thanks, Erin. Um, if there's any public comment, just raise your hand. I'm going to keep an eye on the, the room. Um, I don't see any right now. So applicants who anyone like to go first, take it away. Josh, I see you're unmuted. Yes, perfect. Good evening. Thanks for having us again. Again, Josh Klein, Stonefield Engineering and Design. Um, so yeah, we're, we're excited to be back. Uh, definitely some hard work happening in the background, working with Aaron, you know, resubmitting kind of all the materials to kind of get to this point. Um, we did want to, you know, we're, we want to kind of be open and I guess communicate with the with the commission kind of through the process. So we do anticipate um, in reviewing um, some of the feedback from the zoning board, as well as some more recent soil testing that was done, that the stormwater facility on site will have to be kind of modified. The shape of it and the height of it would have to be modified. Um, so, you know, we were kind of, we, we met with Erin and, and, and spoke with her about it, and we wanted to bring it up um, to the commission. All of the, and I, I wanted to just pull up a plan, basically any, any changes that would be present to the plan would be outside of kind of that 100 foot buffer or outside of any, you know, kind of jurisdictional area in terms of what the commission looks like. So, you know, what I was going to kind of highlight in, in kind of reviewing what we anticipate is the stormwater facility that you, you kind of see here today. Um, we do anticipate the shape of it will change and it may expand a little bit further to the right. And we may end up having to rotate the sediment four bay and adjusting some of the elevations. Um, we wouldn't be increasing any disturbance within the buffer areas. We wouldn't be changing any of the disturbance or plantings in the buffer areas. So, you know, I think we, um, you know, from that end are pretty comfortable that, you know, that it would, it wouldn't impact the order of conditions if the, you know, the commission decided to go through this evening and adopt it. Um, and we'd be obviously happy to, and I would think one of the conditions is we would continuously share any plan changes. But we are sensitive if you know the commission feels that they'd rather you know wait and see the plan. I think our intent would be to submit and, and join the 214. I believe it's 214 is the next meeting. So we could kind of submit that plan prior and have that included um, in you know as the kind of approval plan. So um, everything else has been addressed. You know, again, we're you know, we put together um in a invasive species management plan. Um, we've kind of worked closely with Aaron to put together a separate O&M um, plan for the project. So we do, you know, feel that I think all the conditions we were we were comfortable with. I think there was one Aaron we worked with to maybe adjust one word. So kind of wanted to at least present that to the uh, to the commission. I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, but that's really where we are. Is I think we would. We would be comfortable moving forward, but if the commission would feel more comfortable kind of waiting to see that that change to the stormwater basin, we're happy to to kind of continue to the next meeting. Thanks, Josh. Commissioners, any comments, questions? Alex, go ahead. Yeah, two things. Um, now previously, we talked about a no mo area, and I tried to find that um, on the plans and I got, I'm not quite sure where it is, but my concern was ticks. And um, if, if, if families are having their kids come in playing in the no mow area and their pets come in covered with ticks, they're going to mow it. And I don't know what we have um, to, to say they can't. Um, ticks aren't in our bailiwick. But if that was a condition that um, somehow the commission was considering important, um, I don't think there's a long-term way that we can enforce it, um, even months out or years out, if if people are going to be bothered by ticks. So that's and I I'll pause and ask for some feedback. Then I have one other point, different point. Alex, just yeah, to no clarify. Problem. Do you mean the the um, knotweed area, or is this a, a different no, like a pollinator? Okay, there's a, so. there, they, in the application, they have a, a, a no mow area, and there's a whole list of no mow seeds or okay, grass sources. And, and I think it would be best for Lee to address it because it's it's a no mow grass. It's not a no mow 
meadow, I think is maybe potentially where the confusion is. And so I think Lee can address the um, plant characteristics of the no mow grass and how high that typically gets. I, I don't foresee it as being a tick issue because I don't think the height of it is going to be long enough, but I'll defer to Lee to answer the question regarding the no mow plant material. Sure. Um, the the no mow um, seed mix is a mix of um, fescue grasses. And the idea is that um, it's not, <clears throat> it doesn't grow as quickly as other types of grasses. So you can only mow it <clears throat> once or twice a year. But if you choose to have a shorter, uh, more manicured look, you can mow it every couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> and the idea is that that would be used immediately around the <clears throat> uh, homes and in the limited use areas so that the homeowner can manage the property as they see fit. And then beyond those areas, we would have a more traditional meadow uh, seed mix which would get taller, but that would not be immediately adjacent to the homes. Yeah, well, I just thought I'd bring it up and um, it may be a bit outside our jurisdiction, but uh, still the thought did occur to me that um, might be an issue and thought I'd want to listen to what you had to say about it. Thank you. Um, uh, the other concern I have is has to do with um, contaminants and what may have happened when Matusco had their shop. And I saw the email that you folks wrote about drilling and contaminated analysis and not finding anything. <clears throat> and um, I did go and stand on the cement slabs where there's two big uh, drains and um, some questions were raised uh, on the side about what might have been gone down those drains when in the early days when Matusco ran that, ran that shop. I can remember it being there, but it goes back a long time. So I thought I'd just say on the record that I called Mike Matusco, uh, who now runs Matusco Trailer Repair Shop uh, in Sunderland on 116, and he worked there during the 80s. He was very willing to talk. And um, he said nothing that he knows of got dumped down the drain. That oil was put in 55-gallon drums and either burned to heat the, the shop or it was shipped off for reuse. And um, um, he could not speak to what happened during the 50s. He simply wasn't isn't old enough to 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 have his history go back that far. <clears throat> but um, um, hold on, I got my notes right here. Anyways, it was a very pleasant conversation, cordial, and um, he was he talked freely. And the bottom line is, he didn't know of anything uh, contaminant wise that would have been put down those drains. I asked him what the drains were connected to and whether or not they went out to the street. He said in the old days, there was no sewer in the street out there to connect to. Um, I asked him if it might've been connected to a uh, septic field because there was a bathroom. He said, I don't, he, he didn't know. He just didn't know. So um, I, I just put that out there. Um, um, for members of the public, the record, you folks to know that I did have a conversation with Mike and um, nothing came of it. So I tried to follow up on a concern that was raised by a citizen who uh, has trouble logging on and and not all that con computer savvy. And um, he appreciated my following up on it. So Aaron asked me to say something about it during this meeting. I'm I'm done. Thanks, Alex, for connecting like that. Um, and just for members of the public, a phase two has been conducted on the property and no contaminants were found. So um, all clear. Yeah. Although, Josh, you mentioned some more recent soil testing. Is there anything to report in that regard? We just, again, nothing was reported, but we were doing stormwater testing. Got it. 
Okay, Jason, you had your hand up. I don't see it anymore. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just going to ask about this. Was the soil testing more for infiltration in the basins, or was it more for pollutants? It was. It was really more for stormwater in the basins. Will you be expanding your limit of disturbance? Um, we we don't in, intend to expand the limit of disturbance uh, within any of the buffer areas. Um, we, you know, if we look and may have to go right or left, we will. But again, there's no intention to expand limit of disturbance. Andre, go ahead. Just curious, is there, uh, from your end, is there any, does it make any difference whether we go ahead with uh, approving um, or with a vote on this today or whether we uh, wait until February 14th? Well, we we think it might help. It clears. I kind of think it clears the agenda um, for you know for future applicants for you. Um, it does kind of ensure that we remain on the timeline. I think our ZBA meetings on the fifteenth, um, but it you know we we do have the ability to attend the fourteenth meeting as well. And also, and I'll just add that the zoning board of appeals is waiting for this to be wrapped up and completed before they'll take their their final vote. And we're at the end of the process with them. Our next meeting with them on the 15th is to review the decision and the conditions. Thanks, guys. I think our general procedure is to have the plans in hand first before we make a move on it. So um, I suggest, commissioners, unless anyone has any more comments, that we continue this to the 14th and review the final plans first. If everyone's in agreement, looking for a motion to continue. I move that we can go ahead, Andre. Sure. Uh, I move to uh, <laughs> I move to continue the hearing. Um, uh, I thought you were ready. February 14th. It wasn't exactly ready, but uh, I moved to, <laughs> let me come up with this. I move to continue the uh, hearing for the notice of intent uh, by uh, Stony Fuel Engineering and Design um, on behalf of Valley Community Development for the construction of 15 residential duplex structures uh, at uh, ball, uh, 20 to 40 Ball Lane. So to you, we have to just no a date certain so i would suggest um february 14th at 7:55 until february 14th at 7:55 second andre on the motion bruce on the second alex aye bruce aye jason aye andre aye and sorry about that long motion <laughs> all good aye i'm an aye so if you guys are able to get me the plans, uh, once again, we'll have everything teed up um, and it'll certainly be available to the zoning board so that um, they'll have it for the 15th and to do our best to keep um, everything moving for you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And we will see you all on the 14th and have plans in hand to you by the 7th. Thanks, guys. Thank see you. Soon. Have Thank a you. good night. Yep. Bye. Okay. Um... Still not seeing any hands from the public. So I'm going to move on to Pure Sky. So abbreviated notice of resource delineation for Pure Sky. Am I missing something, Aaron? There's a, a hand up oh, in the audience. Is. It's Lawrence. Lawrence, is this um go ahead? Do you want me to promote him? Oh, I'm okay. allowing him to talk. Is this Lawrence with Fort River? No, nope, someone yeah. else. Yeah. Is that <laughs> Welcome, Lawrence. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I uh, appreciate uh, everybody who uh, cares about uh, this so much and shows up every uh, two weeks or whatever it is and works in between. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm hearing that uh, uh, there's been an a investigation about what's uh, what went down the drains. Uh, but I live next door and uh, the drains themselves have not been removed. I, I would like uh, to hear, I, I, I wish that the uh, people who are going to do the building uh, would uh, 
volunteer to uh, test a, what's under the pad that the drains are built into. Uh, the drains themselves have, were not removed and there were no tests test done under the cement pad itself. I, I wish that they would uh, say that, as I understand they have said to people, uh, I wish they'd say legally that they'll look again uh, uh, to find any uh, oil or uh, antifreeze or uh, asbestos or uh, uh, lead weights uh, that uh, may have washed down those drains. What were the drains for? Uh, uh, there, if, if, uh, so uh, uh, that's my request is that, uh, and uh, once again, I'm so grateful that everybody is uh, uh, caring so much about this. Uh, and it is tick heaven out here. Uh, uh, unmowed grass will uh, be full of ticks. And uh, uh, the one other thing is uh, the knotweed. Uh, I've never heard of getting rid of knotweed without uh, using Roundup. But uh, good luck. Uh, and uh, let's not use Roundup. Uh, so those are my concerns. Thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to the public. Thanks, Lawrence. Aaron, do you want to address some of the water quality issues? Yeah, I understand from the applicant that they are their intention is to test under the pad once the pad is removed. Um, that was something that was stated to me. So, um, you know, they're, from what I understand, fully committed to making sure that the site is safe prior to constructing homes there. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was stated. Now, uh, I think we should, however, ask that at the start of the next hearing, just since it's been raised by the public so that they can confirm on the record. But um, speaking with them, um, I asked the very same question uh, on my initial review and and that's what I was told. So um, just as a point of information to respond to the public comment. Okay, maybe we could communicate with that to them before they get back to the next meeting. All right, I saw some other commissioner hands up. Did anyone want to follow up on that? Go ahead, Bruce. Do we know Lawrence's last name for the notes? Quigley. Sorry? Quigley. Quigley, okay. Thanks, Alex. Right, I should say to the public, if you're gonna do public comment, please state your full name. Okay, um, and just to follow up about the knotweed, we did spend some time talking about a more comprehensive plan for that, which is going to be appended to the um, order of conditions. And um, I agree, Lawrence, it's a tough one. There's wetland specific herbicides to use, but um, we're paying attention to it. So that's what I can tell you. Okay, I don't see any other hands up. Um, Back to our abbreviated notice of resource delineation for Pure Sky Development Incorporated on behalf of WD Coles Inc. Represented by Goddard Consulting for the confirmation of resource area boundaries on site limited to areas that fall within the 100 feet of the proposed solar installation at Shootsbury Road, map 9B, lots 11 and 12, map 9D, lot 27. Okay, so this information came in fairly late, um, past the deadline. Uh, our third party reviewer did not have time to look at it before the meeting. So we requested to um, a continuance. I'll take public comment if anybody has anything, but just please raise your hand. Um, commissioners, anything? Okay. Can I say something, Michelle? Go for it. Um, so I just wanted to make sure to state that, um, and I think I forwarded it to commissioners, but um, I, I want to say it was Tuesday, we received an updated plan from um, the applicant that um, has the additional wetlands, which were found on the site by our third party peer reviewer. So those were flagged in the field. They were picked up um, and added to the survey document, survey plan document. Um, that has been forwarded to our third party peer reviewer um, who is gonna complete the uh, final review of that and provide a report to the commission. Um, obviously we didn't have time to do that before this meeting, but I will post the um, updated plan on the town website probably later this week so that anybody who'd like to view it can see it um, that hasn't already been shared with. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Erin. 
Um, any other questions, comments? Okay, looking to continue. I move to continue the public hearing for Shrewsbury Road A N R A D to 7.35 p.m. on 1-2-14-24. Alex, on the motion, I got Jason on the second. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Next up, we have SWCA notice of intent on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for the construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structures in the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetland at lot 13 Olympia Drive, Matt 8D, lot 15, 16, and 3. Um, another continuance, I think they're needing more time on the plans for this. Erin, do you want to fill us in on anything? Yeah, I did have a conversation with Kristen. Um, um... I'm drawing a blank on our last name right now, but the representative for uh, UMass. And I did let her know that, um, you know, there had been questions from the commission about when UMass planned to be back. Um, they said that they were doing some internal planning meetings and she would provide an update to me as soon as she could. I do know that they were working um, and focusing a lot of attention towards the, the culvert and um, the commissioners might recall that we issued an emergency certification because of the scour issues that were happening um, on the stream, which um, if you look at the latest uh, report from that project, they've hopefully resolved that. It looks it looks great. Um, so I just wanted to provide an update that I did let the applicant know that the commission is questioning why this has been continued um, seven or eight times at this point. Thanks, Aaron. Bruce, go ahead. Are we waiting for them to appear again before deciding about the third party review? I see a question. It's like the third bullet from the bottom there. Yeah, um, I think that they they need to come before the commission. And there was a there was a uh, there was staff comments, and they've only responded partially to the staff comments. So I think um, there are additional. Um, adjustments or responses that need to be made to the plans. And um, I think it's just a resource allocation issue that they're they're okay. working on it. Go ahead, Andre. Uh, just uh, in response to Bruce's question, uh, I believe what happened was we agreed to um, hold off on the third, on requiring that third party uh review until they until our next meeting with them uh, we were going to uh, do that on the on the last meeting that we actually had with them and it and uh, i think they were uh, that they were looking to have us make that decision after they get the the rest of the information am i right about yeah. That? yeah they were doing some additional site investigation and checking the resource area boundaries updating the plans go ahead alex i for one i'm looking forward to hearing from them after being on the site two or three times um and the memory doesn't tend to fade too much but is there a requirement for us to continue to have it on our agenda taking up a space or can we put it aside and simply wait for to hear from them and then put it back on the agenda because every time we continue it it uses up time yeah that's a great question so because it's a public hearing because the butters were notified and there was a legal ad in the newspaper we are required to um schedule a date certain for a hearing a uh, date and time certain and announce that at every meeting um, so one thing I could do is check in with Christian offline and say, do you have a timeline of when you expect, um, that you might have a response and we could push this, you know, two or three meetings down the line so that we're not doing it at every single meeting. Um, I could inquire with her and see if UMass would be comfortable with that since it is taking up a time slot and we've had some pretty, um, bulky meetings with lots of business. So um, I'll, I can check in with her and see if that's something that UMass is willing to consider. So chair, if I could just yeah, follow up on that. 
Go ahead. So could we change the motion so that we don't automatically put it on for the 14th um, um, and sort of assume that it won't be on the 14th since you're going to communicate with her? Or do we really need to put it on for the 14th to let you take the time to communicate with her? I think we should put it on for the, the 14th. And then if we can con push it to, you know, March or April, um, come up with a date okay. and time with the applicant that they can be happy with. Okay, just trying to economize on our time. I appreciate that, Alex. And I guess just keep your eye on the next um, PowerPoint to see if there's going to be any updates and we can shave off five minutes if not. All right, without looking for a motion to continue. So I'll move. move. I'll move to continue the public hearing for lot 13 Olympia Drive <laughs> notice of intent to 740 p.m. on 214.24. I'm gonna give that one to Jason. I'll give Bruce the second. Alex. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. <laughs> Notice of intent for Tetra check on behalf of Fort River Solar 2 LLC for construction of an operation of a 6.35 megawatt direct current ground mounted photovoltaic solar facility and appurtenant components at 191 West Pomeroy Lane, map 19D, lot 10. I see Lawrence and I see Matt. I'm gonna bring you guys in. All right, Erin, do you want to fill us in? Yes. Um, so um, town staff has met with um, Pure Sky and their representative um, a few times since the last Conservation Commission meeting. And um, based on our, our meetings and our conversations, we, we sort of all concluded that the best approach would be for the um, battery um, portion of the notice of intent application to to be removed until such time that um, we can get additional information from Pure Sky about the um, safety um, of the investigations from the um, the fires that have occurred. Uh, one thing I did want to make sure that I stated on the record was that um, at the last meeting, um, I stated that there had been um, five fires uh, from the Powen batteries. And uh, I wanted to just make sure I corrected that because I was um, operating on some misinformation. So um, from what I understand, the correct information is that there's been four and that um, only three of them have been in the last six months. So I wanted to just make sure that I clarified that for the record. Um, and before I forget. <laughs> um, so um, all things considered, the, the applicant has investigations underway um, on the, the fires that, that did occur, and the results of the investigations aren't fully available to be provided to the town yet. So we want to provide them a little time to complete those and get the results to the town. Um, and once they're available and made um, given to the town and were able to resolve sort of the outstanding questions, at that point, they'd come back to the Conservation Commission to present that. Um, we're also working with the applicant to try to come up with an alternative emergency access. And that's something that um, is going to require some sort of off offline um, coordination with staff and uh, another private landowner. Um, but we're, we're working, sort of all parties working together to try to find a solution to that. Um, and am I forgetting anything? I think I've covered everything, but... Um, one one um, just last minute sort of discussion that was had was um, because there's uh, we didn't get uh, updated plans seven days prior you know a week ahead of this meeting so this was all um, sort of agreed to on Monday and so um, in consideration of that I was sort of trying to have it teed up for multiple different possibilities of what might happen tonight. I have an order of conditions drafted, which has been sent to the applicant for their review. 
I did also include it in the OneDrive for commissioners to review. Um, <clears throat> I also requested a 21 day waiver for the issuance of the order of conditions on the um, instance that the commission wanted to close the public hearing tonight, but not issue the order of conditions. And the reason for that is because the February 14th meeting date falls exactly 21 days after um, our meeting tonight. And so if, for example, the commission closed the public hearing tonight, but wanted to wait to issue the order of conditions until the 14th, um, when updated plans were available, um, it wouldn't provide adequate time for me to be able to issue the order of conditions after the approval. So the applicant did provide a waiver, but only for us to have until the day after the meeting, which still isn't really enough time for me to be able to issue after approval is given. So um, uh, just circling all that back is kind of where we are now. Um, they, there was a draft plan that was provided, um, which I have not had a chance to review because it came in um, about 4.30 this afternoon. Um, and the letter also came in 4.30 this afternoon. So that's where things stand. And I'll take a step back and let commissioners and the applicant have a chance. Okay, so um, just to follow up on that, the batteries have been removed from the NOI and the intent is to um, hopefully include them as an amendment to the NOI in the future. The amendment would include generally the same things as the NOI, um, a butter notification, advertisement in the paper, um, just not uh, procedurally, uh, it would be a problem with um, DPW, I mean, DE, <laughs> Mass DEP to have, four different permits on the same property. Um, so that is the procedural outlook that we have. As far as tonight, the applicants would like to close the public meeting. The concern is that we don't have the final plans in hand and with a 21 day plus one day extension to issuing the order of uh, conditions that puts us in a very tight spot for um, full review from the commission. So just to recap all that. And I'm gonna hand it over to Matt or Lawrence who would like to speak. Great, thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you for uh, the overview. You took took my thunder there on filling everyone in. Um, <clears throat> so yes, the battery storage portion of the project has been removed. The only changes to the plans since the ones that were submitted back on January 10th are removal of re note references and detail references associated with the best components. And we could take two minutes right now and kind of walk through the two plan sheets that reference the, the pad locations and just show that the, the removal of that equipment from the submission. So the changes that have occurred since the January 10th submission are extremely minimal. The rest of the requests that have been made by the commission were incorporated in the January 10th plans. So we were hopeful that the commission would be comfortable with the battery storage being removed to not only close the public hearing, but issue the order of conditions. If that's not something the commission's comfortable doing tonight, uh, I think us as, as uh, the applicants team wouldn't fully be comfortable with closing the public hearing and then having another public meeting where you're reviewing conditions where we don't have an opportunity to speak. Um, so I just want to put that out there as as you guys chat through uh, any questions, comments tonight, that it's, it's really both or neither is, is kind of what we're hoping for uh, this evening. I did want to point out that in addition to removing the, the best from the plans, there are no impacts to the stormwater management report. We conservatively, if you may remember, we conservatively assumed that the pad areas, those elevated areas would be entirely impervious which they are not. So the removal of those components don't change our analysis. Um, if when they come back in later, uh, I noticed there's a condition in there. Similarly, it wouldn't change any of the stormwater uh, analysis or components for the project at a later date. All that remains the same. The design right now is conservative and assumes all, full impervious and assumes batteries, a battery pad would be installed at a later date. So I think that really sums it up between what Aaron said and what, what I just ran through. Uh, would love to hear if the commission has any additional questions or comments on the project as it stands with the batteries removed. Thanks, Matt. Um, public comment, raise your hand if you have any. I'm gonna keep an eye on it. Not seeing any in the few seconds. So commissioners, comments, questions. Go ahead, Jason. 
Yeah, I wanted to make sure last time I asked the question about making sure that we're reviewing what we're able to review, uh, meaning we were having a lot of conversation about the batteries themselves. Um, again, it's my understanding we, the Conservation Commission, cannot approve what type of battery per se is used. That's something that's up to the fire department. And I want to make sure with the removal of the batteries, if they're going to be, it's my assumption that if in the future they're going to be put on via some sort of addendum, you know, are we all, were we comfortable with the plan for, um, I'm going to say secondary containment or containment of any potential water for putting out fires? That, that's my understanding is that will, that's what we were concerned with. And that's what is in our jurisdiction to review or have reviewed. And I just want to make sure that's correct. And then, like you said, we don't have full plans then. So if you do an addendum, is that going to come back in front of us to review that as well? Yeah, so the amendment would be new and it would be done presumably after you've talked thoroughly with the fire department and there was sufficient emergency access ways. So all the things Aaron said that is the reason why the bets is being taken off is because there were just too many questions about, you know, flooded waterways. So that and there are a couple other safety issues that would be addressed. So it would basically be a new plan for the best with all of those addressed that would come back to us and we would review it the same way we've reviewed the NOI essentially. So we don't have to make assumptions about what we've already reviewed in relation to the best and what we're gonna be approving for the NOI for the solar only. Does that answer your question on that one? Yeah, yep. Michelle, and if I if I may add a little color to that as well. Um, you know, we, we heard the commission's feelings on the batteries over the last few meetings and in discussing with the other town stakeholders. Um, we felt it was in everyone's best interest for us to get more in line with what you guys are typically doing for a process where we're coming back um, to share the information and to, to show you we've received approval from the fire chief, as opposed to asking the commission to approve anything prior to that approval. So the goal is, is to go get approval from the fire chief for any fire and public safety related concerns come back and present that information to the commission and take it from there. Thanks, Matt. That's exactly what we'd like to see. Um, Aaron, I saw your hand up. Did you have something to follow up on that? Well, just relative to the containment, um, you know, it's possible that something about the pad could change. And if, if that was the case, um, that would be included in an amendment that came before the commission at that time. Um, I think the results of the investigations might could possibly trigger some change with the pad and and again i think we sort of cross that bridge when we come to it but the containment system that is part of the the plan currently um was for all of the original infrastructure that was proposed on the plan and so um without the battery storage, I think that the containment that is provided is, from my understanding, meeting with the electrical inspector, the um, town engineer, um, myself reviewing it, that it's completely sufficient for the equipment that is proposed on the plan. And again, once battery storage is incorporated back in, you know, there may be adjustments, but that we would, that would be presented to the commission at that point. Thanks, Aaron. Go ahead, Alex. I understood from the gentleman that the pad would not be constructed at this time. Did I hear him correctly? And I have one other question. You did. That is correct. Anything related with the, the battery storage and the storage pad would, is not part of the project at this time. Okay. Could you tell me, the, just so this is a matter of a definition of a word, what does a pertinent mean? A, a, a pertinent facilities, what's included? I that, looked that up. I looked that up because it's not a word that I commonly use. No, I, I, it's got to be an engineering term. Honestly, I, I get that question quite a bit. It's it's other elements of the project. Uh, so you've got the the solar, you know, the ground mounted solar facility, and then we say and all our pertinent structures. Well, 
the fences, the, the pads, if there's bars, all those miscellaneous items that are associated with the project, that's what that means. So rather than listing out 30 minor little items, you just cover it with that appurtenant structures. So one of the definitions that I found included batteries on, as a pertinent stroke facilities. Is that true? It, I mean, it could be. I, someone could roll it up in there. Uh, that's not the case here. We're taking the batteries out. So the battery so storage you, component of the product has been removed. So would you have any objection for us clarifying that a pertinent facilities does not include batteries? That is perfectly fine. Yeah. In this case, it's it's fencing and gates and equipment pads that are shown on the plan. So your transformers, your inverters, th th that type of equipment. So I have no problem with, with any clarification that the batteries are removed. I think it's a great word. I, I'm trying to figure out how to work it into my vocabulary. <laughs> no one told me I was saying it wrong the whole time, but go ahead, Andre. Yeah, yeah it's also a legal term uh, yeah. that, uh, that essentially uh, specifically to the uh, Fourth Amendment and... Um, in search warrants and so on, you would be looking at a house plus the appurtenances, which are the other structures, satellite to the uh, to the main um, to the yeah, main saw that. thing that they're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So that. similar idea. Okay, so we're looking for a definition with along with the or the project plans, just specific to it. But thank you for clarifying. Thanks, Alex, for sure. looking into that. Yeah, Pertinent. so um, I don't I don't need the definition. All I really want to do is clarify that for what we're doing going forward, batteries are not uh, uh, included in a pertinent facilities. That's all. Per this NOI, right? Okay. And per this NOI. So, um, yeah, no, I don't need a. I, I wasn't asking to include a definition, but asking him if he minded if we specified that batteries because he's got a memo saying batteries are off the table for now if we put in the order that we would that we would uh, look at that a pertinent facilities doesn't include batteries okay heard lawrence go ahead thank you by the way um little little humor yeah i just wanted to clarify the condition one of the proposed order of conditions specifically says that batteries comes back to the uh, Conservation Commission. So th yeah. there's no ambiguity that there's uh, this is the full and final permission for the for the batteries. That's uh, not nobody's intention. We're happy to do it, but there, there is a condition that specifically says we come back. OK, thanks, Lawrence. So before us is a decision to I, I think what you guys want is to either keep the public meeting open and not issue the order of conditions or to do both. Um, I don't think we're ready to issue the order today without plans in hand, final plans in hand. Um, commissioners, let's, you wanna do a show of hands. Um, who wants to continue the, okay, let's see. Does anyone wanna, okay, you don't wanna close the public meeting. Lawrence, go ahead. I, what I What I wanna do is just make sure that if we, if we do kind of keep it open and go to the next meeting, that we're coming back with absolutely everything that the commission wants us to provide. So the updated plans, are there any additional conditions that you, or any conditions that have been proposed that you're not comfortable with or any other uh, issues with the plans that you want corrected? Or is it just a question that we'll be, uh, we'll be coming back at the next meeting with the revised set of plans and, and just go through the formality? Okay, last chance, commissioners. What else do we need from them so that we can move this forward next meeting? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I don't have a list. I have kind of a general question. So I have straight in my head what we would be most likely to be approving. So this is directed to Lawrence and the others. Is, as, as I guess it, we would be approving further construction of the project, putting in the arrays uh, up to the some limit. Uh, I think there's a specified uh, certain amount of battery arrays and whatnot. But anyways, you would be constructing the project uh, within whatever whatever limits uh, Aaron specifies. 
uh, except for putting in the the pad and the batteries and the the, the electrical connection. Other than that, it would be essentially the same. Yeah, we've seen so, we've been looking at it, so I think correct. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that okay. is that is correct. Yes. So there, there's nothing that's, else that's... changing to the proposed project with the, except for the removal of. So we had a battery storage pad here and some notes re re referencing it and a battery storage pad here. Everything else remains exactly as previously submitted up through the last plan set on January 10th, which incorporated responses to a handful of requests that Aaron had about additional dimensions, references to the reinforced turf uh, across the, the sewer department easement. Uh, so it's literally just removal of a handful of notes, a few lines, and a couple of details from the January 10th plan set. So I thought I'd just feed back in, in lay terms what I understand you said. And uh, it looks like I I understand. Um, and by pulling the batteries out of the project that gives time to to resolve battery issues, come up with the north entrance, a whole bunch of stuff, takes the pressure off, the project can go forward. Um, you can keep on that schedule and um, we'll come back another day to deal with the batteries after the fire department approves it. Sounds great. Couldn't have said it any better myself. Well said. Any other comments, commissioners, in regards to, um, okay, Dave, go, go ahead. Yeah, if I could, Michelle, I just wanted to come back to Lawrence's question, which I think is really important. You know, he's just trying to clarify that really, if you don't close the hearing and in between now and your next meeting, you get the updated plan sets that Matt has referenced, that at your next meeting, it would be simply a procedural vote to close the hearing and and move forward. That there there's no other no other concerns that the commission has now that the battery storage has been removed for the time being. I just think I heard Lawrence saying he just wanted clarification that that is what will happen at the next meeting. Is that what will happen at the next meeting? Go ahead, Andre. Uh, just to uh, be one person, uh, one of the commissioners answering that question. Uh, from my point of view, that's the plan. Um, but remember that uh, there will be public comment as well. And so we need to take that into account. So my my thought is that 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 we should have everything then but there's going but if we keep it open to public comment then we need to keep an open mind to whatever uh, the public is talking about yes um all right i'm just going to do a show of hands commissioners who is in favor of continuing the public meeting and um okay matt do you want, <laughs> you want to no, ask no, one okay. continue continue um Alex, before I take the show of hands, do you want to add one more thing? No, I was showing my hand. Okay, I'd like to do the visual show of hands. This is too confusing oh. for me. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, yes, visual show of hands. Who's in favor of continuing the public meeting and having the plan set in hand to close this and issue the order conditions on February 14th, show of hands. Okay, that's unanimous. Okay. Um, Matt, go ahead. I think what we all understand is that we've reviewed this in terms of the solar array enough times that we don't have any further questions. And I think we all understand um, what we're thinking about. And this is sort of procedural so that we just have those final plans in hand before we actually close the meeting and issue the order conditions. And we have plenty of time to do that. So if that's satisfactory to you guys, um, we can just move ahead with continuing tonight. Lawrence, are you okay with that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, in terms of the procedure moving forward, Aaron, do you want us to submit a full set of plans without the stamp? 
or are we good to go to final signed and sealed and give them to you tomorrow? Because they're done. They've yep. been they've been done for a, for a few hours now, and I know that's not a ton of time, but all we did was remove some line work and some labels from the plans. Yep. Yeah. Yep. If you're um, it, all other edits are incorporated and you're you're good to go, then that would be wonderful. Okay. And, and I can get it... everything you know drafted and have the final revision dates and get them to the commission, post them on our website so that um, everything is queued up. Okay. Great. And the commission had an opportunity to review the January 10th set and we're good. Yeah. I mean, all revisions have been provided to the commission to date. Okay. Um, Perfect. So. Go ahead, Bruce. Michelle, are there any public comments? I see no hands up. Okay. Last call for public comments. I've been keeping an eye on it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, I'm looking for a motion to continue and Hopefully we just move this very smoothly next meeting. I move the pub to continue the public hearing for Tetra Tech on behalf of Fort River Solar um, to 2.14 at 7.50 p.m. Second. Um, that was Bruce on the first, who had the second? I did. Andre on the second. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an eye. Okay. I'm an eye too. Jason. Sorry, Jason. Oh. <laughs> Fell off the board there. Jason's an eye. All right. Thanks for working with us, guys. And we'll see you on the 14th. And Appreciate the time. This coming together. All right. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. See you then. Okay. So we have one last on the agenda, I think. Okay, 30 Kessler Lane. I see Nate oh, Wilson. Uh, uh, no, we have one more hearing that just needs continuing. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, Wendell Wetland Services notice of intent on behalf of Kevin and Mary O'Brien for the construction of a new 1,200 square foot single family home and associated site work within riverfront area of Eastman Brook at 260 Leverett Road, map 3A lots 50. This project is proposed as a riverfront redevelopment project replacing an existing garage and chicken coop um, structure. The applicant has requested to continue this public hearing. So if there's any public comment, please use your hand fairly quickly. All right, seeing none, any commissioner questions? Or Aaron, do you have an update for this? Um, town staff did meet um, with uh, Mr. O'Brien today um, to discuss sort of an appropriate path forward. Um, somewhat of a complicated situation because there's a historic structure on the house that they're trying to preserve um, and also build a new home. Um, so town staff have been sort of trying to guide Mr. O'Brien in the appropriate direction. And he's also been doing some additional um, uh, due diligence on the site um, by way of perk test and uh, a um, septic design. So the initial um, plan that was provided to us was like a hand rendered um, drawing that didn't include a lot of the detail and requirements that um, plans require. So he's he's working to try to bring that up to um, the requirements that the commission would need to approve it. So he's doing his due diligence to try to come up to to bring the plan to where it needs to be. Great, thank you. Okay. I'm seeing no hands, so looking for a motion. Wait a minute, I got a question. Go ahead. Have we had a site visit to this, Aaron? And if not, could we? Yes, absolutely. Um, part of why there has not been a site visit was because the plans, in my opinion, were not adequate to describe the proposed work. And um, I don't think that the work area could have been staked out identified um, and uh, been um, accurate for the commission to review on, in the field on the site uh, as it was presented in the initial application. And you're welcome to go on um, the town's website and it was also provided in um, previous folders, but on the town website, Town of Amherst Conservation Commission under current applications, you're welcome to take a look at the site plan that was submitted. Um, it wasn't to scale. Um, it was it was like sort of a hand drawn sketch, um, and so that's why I didn't even schedule a site visit. And quite frankly, I was going to reject the application 
um, and tell them that they needed to come back. But unfortunately, DEP issued a file number for it. Um, I don't think they even looked at the plan when they issued the file number. And once the DEP issues a file number, it starts the clock on 21 days for us to open the public hearing. So they sort of um, tied our hands with regard to um, requiring the plan to be submitted um, as to the standard it needed to be. So that's why uh, the hearing was opened because we had to from a regulatory standpoint. So Michelle, can I follow up on that? Go for it. I would prefer to have a site visit to continue this until we have a site visit. Uh, if Erin can arrange that, if for some reason or other she advises against it, maybe she could provide pictures. I agree. I think a site visit once we have actual plans is basically the most efficient way to do this. So I think that's what we're looking at, right? Yes. And this is a Riverfront Redevelopment Act. So I think that's a little different than things we've dealt with before. So just bone up on your, you know, mass yeah. regs before you head over there. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Looking for a motion unless there's anything else. I move to continue the public hearing to two for 260 Leverett Road to 214.24 at 7.45 p.m. Second that. Andre on the motion, just on Jason on the second. Alex. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. I am recusing myself from this next one. And Andre has offered to chair it. So thank you, Andre. And I'll just be staying by. You're welcome. Okay. Hello. So the next uh, next up is a request for minor administrative change for a 30 Kestrel Lane. Um, Erin, do you have uh, some words? Yes. Um, so I just promoted um, Nate Wilson and um, Jeff Squire. Um, so um, yeah. There was previously an order of conditions that was issued for this property um, It's a single family home. There had previously been a approved home addition as well as a um, sort of lean to structure for a vehicle storage. Um, there was uh, mitigation that was required as part of that order of conditions uh, for planting of blueberries. And also um, there was a um, uh, contribution to the wetland mitigation fund. There was also an order of conditions, which I included in the OneDrive folder. Um, the current proposal before us um, is for a, um, uh, and and I'll let the applicant sort of explain the overall situation. But there, uh, there's currently a, um, a a deck structure, which I don't know the exact dimensions of, so that would be something that would be great to clarify, um, but a deck structure that's within 25 feet of the wetlands in the back of the property. Um, and um, the applicant is basically looking to um, have this rolled into their order of conditions. Um, I had suggested that we use the existing order of conditions because DEP does not like us to um, have two orders of conditions open on a single property or two permits open on a given property. So this would um, basically uh, allow a review of the um, proposal under the existing order of conditions. Um, so that's what I have. I might have some additional comments to add, but um, just allow the applicant to explain sort of um, what's brought us here today. Okay, so, so the, the original um, permit was for the lean to structure. Correct. Now, um, now we're uh, looking for a uh, um, minor administrative change, huh? Correct. Okay, Nathan. Okay, can you hear me? And uh, and Jeff as well, or whoever, whatever you want to do. I'll chat. So. Um... Obviously, we did have a site visit the other day, so at least I think two of you have seen the back of our property. But the the goal here I started building is a playhouse uh, for my kids. Um, and I uh, found a spot in the back of the property 
uh, and I measured it out. More, it's more than 25 feet from the wetland marker where I started and started constructing it. Uh, but I thought that was the correct setback as it was when we did the boat shed project uh, a year and a half ago. Um, yeah, yeah. I called the town to see if I needed a building permit and they said no. Um, and to uh, I got to that point, as you can see, and I had a neighbor come and question me about it. And so I asked Erin via email and she said, well, no, you are breaking the law. Well, not necessarily breaking the law, but um, within 50 feet since they changed the, the wetland bylaws. So that's where we're at. I stopped constructing when my neighbor inquired um, and uh, we can go over it in detail. It's just a 12 by 12 elevated structure um, of which Eight by eight of it, I'm going to build a little, or I want to build a little enclosed, you know, shed on top, basically, for the kids, a uh, little playhouse. So we don't, I cited it there for a couple of reasons. There was no trees that needed to be removed. Uh, I thought I was far enough back from the wetland line, but obviously I'm not. Um, and uh, it's kind of a pretty nice little area back there. So. Okay, thank you, Nathan. Uh, looks like uh, looks like Bruce had a question about uh, about what you were commenting. No, I wanted to just to clarify since I went on the site visit, um, it, just to make sure, add doubly sure that what the town building department told you was that you did not need a building permit because of the size of the structure. Is that correct? That is correct. I also, okay. uh, under under two hundred square feet. Um, if it's a shed or playhouse or I don't okay. know, there's a couple other things they said and there is no building permit needed. Okay, that's just clarifying. Okay, anything else uh, from uh, from you or Jeff, uh, Nathan? No, I would just add that, um, you know, I think as, as Aaron pointed out, there's an open order of conditions for the construction of the, you know, shed structure off the side of the garage. They had intended to build an addition um, toward the front of the house uh, along the driveway that never came to fruition. So that part of the original permit didn't happen. And, you know, as, as Nate explained, this was, you know, the goal of what he's doing now was to locate a small, you know, fort for his kids to play in in an area of, you know, he's got a very small um, area of upland in his, in his backyard that is usable. And this was a, a little sort of peninsula of upland be, um, before he got to the railroad tracks that allowed, you know, construction of a, um, you know, this elevated structure um, with minimal disturbance. And I think, you know, the intentions are really just to get the kids out there and, and appreciate that backyard and, and the wetlands that are adjacent to it. Um, so yeah, I think the easiest way to do this was was to amend the existing order. Thank you. Um, let me take a look and see if there's uh, who's here from the public. In the meantime, uh, Aaron, did you have a question or a comment? Um, so I just wanted to note that the order of conditions was issued on October 26, 2022. So um, this was issued when our current um, June 22nd, 2022 bylaws had already been updated. Um, so the, the project was permitted under our current bylaw. I just wanted to clarify that because um, mm -hmm. there was a comment that the bylaw had changed and it it the bylaw was um, updated prior to this permit being um, um, approved. Um, I also just wanted to note a couple of things, which are that um, you know under wetland the Wetlands Protection Act, there's a 50 foot um, setback basically, and anything that's over 50 feet is considered to be a minor activity. So anything that's a um, uh, accessory to a residential structure, deck shed, patio, or pool, which I would consider this structure to be, um, if it's over 50 feet away, doesn't require a permit from the Conservation Commission. What's triggering this is because it is 
um, within 50 feet. And also under our bylaw, this falls within the 50 foot no disturb. So the combination of those two issues is what's basically triggering to him to have to come back to talk to us tonight. The one other comment or just observation on the site that I wanted to share with the commission was that there was um, planting of blueberry bushes, which was a compensatory mitigation requirement as part of the original order of conditions. Um, my observation on the site was that the blueberry bushes were um, built in sort of a constructed um, area, like a garden type thing. And it was stated at the site visit that the applicant is putting bird netting over it and kind of using the berries for, you know, their own consumption. And I think that the whole point of the compensatory mitigation was that it's for wildlife. Um, so basically like we allowed them to encroach on the wetland and plant blueberry bushes to compensate for that impact. And the blueberry bushes are basically being treated as a garden and the wildlife is restricted from accessing it. Um, which I think was kind of counter to what the purpose of the mitigation area was. So mostly wanted to point that out. I think it could have been a break in communication between the commission and the applicants. And so I wanted to clarify that tonight because it's really not appropriate to be blocking the birds from accessing them. Um, the whole point is for them to be accessible to wildlife. So um, that was the comments that I wanted to share with the commission. Thank you, Erin. Um, Nathan, did you get that point? <laughs> Just to check. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm uh, so I don't see any uh, anyone from the public uh, with their hand raised. If you are in the public and you have any questions um, or comments, please raise your hand so that uh, we can uh, include you. Um. Alex? Yeah, I have a procedural question for Aaron. Why is the per, why is the, uh, why is it open? Why does it remain open? And when does it close? That's a good question. Um, so the order of conditions was issued on October 26, 2022. Typically, um, and I don't know when the work was actually completed, um, but it it's really dependent on the applicant. Um, once work is completed that's associated with a given project, like let's say they completed all work that was associated with the project and they wanted to close out the order of conditions, um, at that point they would come back to us with a request for a certificate of compliance and at that point it would close the permit. And so we would no longer have an active permit on the site. Um, it could be that just um, the landowner didn't know that and um, that, you know, or it could be that the site is still being stabilized. The work was fairly recent, um, you know, within the last year. So it could be that, you know, waiting for grass to grow in and waiting for vegetation to become established. Um, final stabilization, usually we like to see achieved before the certificate comes in. But a lot of times landowners just sort of forget about it and the permit just expires and that's okay too. Um, uh, you know, again, we like to get a certificate of compliant to close it out because it makes it a lot easier for the landowner um, long term. So I learned that from Jeff the other day. So, <laughs> but the, I mean, there is a few. There's a there's a, like a little bit of work that I have to do yet on the boat shed. But I mean, the reality is it's otherwise done, and we're not going to do the garage project. Um, at all, so. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. So, sorry. Can you confirm what work was done in our property? So we uh, we built a wing two. We built a wing two structure off the north end of the property, um, and a little elevated. You know, it had to have a little bit of a retaining wall there. Um, 18 inch so high timber retaining wall. Yep. The proposed lean to structure were the nine winterberry hollies planted. The nine winterberry hollies. The nine winterberry hollies. I remember the blueberries. <laughs> but I am happy to make that happen. 
for some reason, I'm having a really difficult time hearing Nate. Are you or Nathan? Are you guys having trouble hearing him too? Okay. Yeah, you kind of come in and out. In and out. Uh, for clarification, I'm looking at the 30 Kestrel Lane site plan. Uh, nine eight twenty two. That is in our folder here. Um, well, let, let me, let's just, uh, is it possible that uh, that we suggested instead of putting something like a uh, holly, which is not a native, uh, that uh, we would have wanted something native like uh, like blueberries? And that was what we agreed to at the end? Possible. possible. I don't believe that I was here when no, I was I involved when this originally took place. Yeah, I'm kind of bringing it up to uh, Michelle and Alex. I, I would, I don't think I was there when we actually did the approval of it. But um... yeah, and now that I'm thinking about it, I don't recall if the blueberries were in addition to the winterberry holly or if they were a substitute for the winterberry holly. Do you guys? It's been a, it's been a long, it's been a, <laughs> a couple years. So. I could certainly go through the um, folder and take a look while we're waiting. Do we have, you know, can somebody sort of pinpoint where on this site plan, since I wasn't able to get to the site visit, um, where this structure is actually being built or has, has been built? Yes. And then Nathan, can you confirm then that as far as like your ground disturbing activity, I see you put the posts in. Like, is that you? You said you're going to build something on top. Have you completed your ground disturbing activity already? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, this is not my world necessarily. So, from the ground disturbing aspect, there's four posts in. There's nothing else that's going to go except for a, or, you know, proposed except for a ladder to get up there. So, you know, yeah, I would I would add uh, Nathan that in your proposal it does say that uh, you you there would be some uh, clearing of brush, I believe, or ground cover. That's that's for the that's in your so if I when I look at uh, when I look at a uh, an email of yours um, in the third paragraph it begins I'm hoping to get your approval to build a twelve by twelve structure uh, with an eight by eight playhouse on it um, a little bit further on it says that spot is ni a nice high point of land and would not require destruction of any trees or large bushes just some ground cover clearing yeah if i could if i could clarify a little bit the the one shrub that nate noted that he removed was there's there's a there's a quite a bit of honeysuckle that has grown up in there um there's a fair amount of invasives just to the I guess lower left of that image is the railroad track. And so the wetlands sort of wrap around the property. This is this little peninsula of, of upland um, that drops off on all three sides down into the wetland area. Um, and it's pretty, uh, there's a little, there was an old storage uh, 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 wood uh, woodshed that the previous owners had, had built back there. So it's an obvious spot for, you know, yard extension if, if that's what you want to call it um, but i think the one shrub that got removed was a honeysuckle which i you know in in my mind the loss of one invasive isn't a huge huge concern but there was no tree removal it was a fairly open area otherwise thanks jeff jeff could you uh, just clarify uh just for my purposes or anyone else's who has the same question are you uh what what's your association with the project sorry i'm uh, i'm with the berkshire design group and we helped nate with the original notice of intent and so just got asked to be brought back in to assist with this thank you jeff okay um i think michelle is next i was just going to comment on the previous um noi for the 
Bochad, Aaron, do you want to bring up the map? I can just remind everyone since me and Alex, I think we're the only people on this. Um, in regards to the nine Hollies, so on the um, the northwest corner where the dot dash line is showing, uh, I think it's the BBW, I can't see it, it's pretty small. The BBW boundary, approximate edge of BBW on delineating the field. So there is a row, it may be a planted autumn olive there that we're taking out. And we had a long discussion about how to do that. And with the um, herbicide applications and spot treatment. So Nate did that. And I think there is a challenge in how to replant it with the winter berry holly. So that is a native. And I don't know that that got done, but I don't remember where the blueberry came in. So that's just a history of it. It was supposed to be a replacement for the removal. I think it was autumn olive on that edge. Great, thank you. Yep. Thank you for the clarification. Bruce, did you have a... Yeah, um, uh, Alex and I were there for the site visit uh, with regard to the spot where part of the structure has already been done. It was pretty minimal. Uh, it certainly comports with what we were talking about here in terms of it being a place that minimal uh, disturbance was needed. Uh, the posts are in. He showed a picture a minute ago. Um, and so it didn't, it, it seemed pretty... It seemed appropriate to have a minor administrative change given what I saw. Thank you, Alex. And if uh, you and Michelle can put your hands down, please. Yeah, if Nathan could uh, bring up his photos again, uh, it would help people understand uh, the site and um, uh, Nate, could you share your, your photos again? And people were asking, where is it and ground disturbance? And those photos speak a thousand words. And I want to echo what Bruce said in terms of, um, uh, yeah, there we go. So there are the posts that he talked about. It's a substantial structure. Um, and as I understand it, the, the stairs going up to it would be right here in the front on the left. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, he was going to put a an enclosure on the top, which wouldn't entirely um, um, cover the deck, but it would have a roof, would shed water, a place for the kids to hang out, have fun, spend the night. And... Um, uh, as you can see, the, the ground around it uh, was uh, lacked vegetation. And what you're seeing in the background uh, is wetland that surrounds this property where this uh, has beavers in it and the railroad tracks are in the back. So this is at the end, the, the end, it would be the west end of his property, I think. Um, and so separating this structure from his house is a is the backyard. So I just wanted to echo um, well, Bruce's comment that it um, doesn't seem to be interfering with much. And um, I personally didn't have a problem with it. <clears throat> Thanks, Alex. Um, so I'm struggling to uh, figure out how this is a minor administrative change, though, um, when it's a completely different and separate um, endeavor, if you would. Um, yeah, it has, it has nothing to do with it. Yeah, so uh, how, uh, Aaron, do you think, and can you help help us out with that? Yeah, so um, frequently when there's orders of conditions open on a given property, rather than filing a whole new permit for additional things that might take place on the property, um, folks will, if so, requesting a minor administrative change is, you know, at the discretion of the applicant. And it's really at the commission's discretion as to whether you consider it to be a minor administrative change or not. Um, 
if you don't think it's minor, you can ask the applicant to come back with a permit filing. You could ask them to file a request for determination, or you could ask them to um, amend the order of conditions to, um, you know, address the additional um, proposed work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then one, I guess one more, uh, I, I'm, I'm also struggling, uh, Nathan, uh, with understanding how, um, how you were, uh, not aware that it's covered under, um, you know, that it's a protected, uh, area. Uh, I could, obviously I was wrong, but I thought the setback was 25 feet. So I measured, you know, it's more than that. So that's what I, that's what I remember from our, the garage project. Um, and my, I, that's, yeah. So <laughs> uh, I, I think that's all I can say. And so I thought it was 25 feet and I started more than 25 feet away and um, I'm wrong. Um, obviously the structure can be removed. It's not like, <laughs> Not like it can't be removed if need be, but that's, you know, that's the answer. Okay. And just, uh, I want to cover all the bases here. Where else would you be able to put that on your property that would not be within that buffer zone? Not very many places, not unless no. it was sitting in my yard. So... And, uh, and, okay, could you explain why you wouldn't want it in the yard? Uh, I don't think that that really provides the atmosphere that we're going for having a little playhouse up in the trees in the woods just sitting in the yard. So, I mean, if this doesn't get approved or whatever, I will remove it and I'm not going to put it someplace different. I'm mm -hmm. not going to just put it in the yard. So just to, just to provide a little context, you know, Nathan's property is, is this house here. Um, you know, there's there's a number of gardens in in this sort of lawn space, but the wetland edge wraps really around you know everything around his backyard. So there isn't much that's outside of that 50 foot. I think you know, to, in in Nathan Nathan's defense, you know, having gone through the permitting process with the the shed structure and understanding that that was permitted within 25 feet, you know, of the wetland edge, just because of the existing conditions he understood that that was, you know, where he needed to set any, you know, new work. And because of the minimum amount of disturbance that was required here, didn't, you know, and thought he had gone through the proper channels. Um, again, it was, it's, it's really, there's, there's very little space on that property that is outside of, um, outside of resource area. All right. Thanks. Uh, Jason. I mean, yeah, just out of curiosity, these wetlands exist just this is my opinion or just looking at the the map here are these wetlands that hydrologically connected to the wetlands or the hot brook on the other side of the railroad tracks yes there's a there's a culvert under the under the railroad tracks okay that just all got bisected by i'm sure by the railroad tracks and then when you know that subdivision all came into play Thanks, Jason and Jeff. Um, Alex. When we first showed up on site for the site visit, Bruce, me, Aaron, and we walked back with Nathan and um, his consultant, one of the first things that Nathan said was, I grew up on 150 acres and I put this back here so my kids could hang out in the trees and look at the birds and the beavers and have a sense of being outdoors. So I think his his intention was to not have a tree house on his lawn, but to give his kids a, a more natural experience, a nature experience, because he specifically talked about being at tree height and looking at the birds and the beavers. And he has beavers come up into his driveway because they're all around his property from because uh, they're in that wetland. So. I appreciate the question about where else could you put it, but um, he he was quite clear that his intention was to create a 
a nature experience for his children. And uh, I don't, I just offer that. Um, um, and moving along from that, I would like to see if we can't move towards closing the permit and in the that process, take care of uh, the blueberries. And the blueberries are smack dab in the middle of his backyard. backyard. They're, and he's got four by four posts around them and he puts nets over them so they can consume the berries. I don't have a problem with him having a blueberry garden, but I do have a little bit of a problem with saying it's mitigation that was asked for, uh, for the lean-to. So maybe he could, um, he, and they're high bush blueberries and they're um, maybe four feet tall. Um, and so the guy likes blueberries. Maybe he could keep his garden and plant some blueberries uh, for wildlife in a in an area that that um, where 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 it would do um, serve another purpose aligned with the permit. Uh, I wouldn't want to ask him to move the blueberries that he's already planted and cultivated because his family already enjoys them. If we were going to resolve the blueberry issue, I would suggest that he could um, perhaps volunteer to plant additional blueberries. <laughs> Uh, in another site that doesn't interfere with his use of his backyard and then move, ask Aaron to do whatever is needed to close the permit and give him the um, uh, order of compliance once all that's taken care of. And if, if people on the board need to go have a site visit, I'm sure Nathan would, would oblige people if they really can't understand what's going on but i don't want to make a big deal out of this it's to me it's not um we got lots of things to deal with and i wouldn't want to make more work out of this than it requires well i am happy to plant some blueberries in some other areas i'm very happy to do that so um and you're welcome so, to yeah. And take a look at the property as well. So, thank you, Aaron. Um. Yeah. So, I mean, I think as far as compliance with the original permit, that the winterberry plant or the the holly plantings and the the blueberry plantings would be a good thing for us to basically round out the work that was already you know, completed on the site that was previously permitted. Um, and I do agree with Alex that once we sort of come to um, a consensus on how to move forward with this, that um, once the site is fully stabilized, that closing out the permit would be a really good idea. Um, I guess a couple things come to mind in terms of the footprint of the, the um, structure and the amount of alteration on the site. I know in the original order of conditions, it basically, I think we were already at 20% alteration in the buffer zone. Um, and so it was stated that the commission wasn't going to allow any additional alteration in the buffer other than minor activities, which this doesn't qualify for as a minor activity. Um, so I guess the question becomes, number one, um, if it is additional, the square footage of the structure, um, it, which is alteration of the buffer, is there some additional um, mitigation that the commission would ask for to compensate for the structure? And I know Nate on the um, proposal had suggested um, that he would, was, was willing to contribute $250 to the wetland mitigation fund, um, just as a sort of upfront um, negotiating point. But that's, you know, there could be additional plantings proposed as compensatory mitigation. Um, so that's just, this is just to sort of get the discussion going about what the commission would like to see and what the commission is willing to consider. Um, you know, I have seen this commission deny a permit that was proposed within 25 feet of a wetland when there was an alternative location farther away for the same structure. I've seen that happen. Um, I saw it with a proposed pool on Southeast Street where um, the owner didn't want to put the pool in front of their view. Um, I don't think that this is hugely different from that. It's, uh, I agree, they don't want it in their lawn backyard. I totally understand that. And it's complicated just trying to think of like fairness across 
applicants and how we consider and how we sort of fairly administer um, sure. the bylaw. Um, but the commissioners may feel different. This is food for thought um, because it does open sort of a can of worms in terms of our no disturb buffer and what we allow in that zone. Thanks, Aaron. Um, Jason. Yeah, Aaron, you mentioned that the the percent um, alteration in the original uh, permit here, but it's my understanding the garage work didn't get done. So then are we deducting that from the original percent and adding? Yeah, so the the original um, expansion of the house footprint was on the garage existing garage, uh, excuse me, existing driveway footprint. So there mm -hmm. was an existing paved driveway. And I think the intention was to um, expand the house into the driveway footprint. So that existing impervious would be accounted for um, that it'd basically be like a essentially a swap of driveway for for house um, expansion. But um, as as Nate said, um, they decided not to complete that addition. Um, and so it was kind of a, um, they just moved forward without doing that. So I, I would like to say that not doing that did decrease the amount of creation of impervious ground by a not insignificant amount. Because if we had extended the driveway out, or the, excuse me, the garage out towards the road, we would have had to increase the footprint of the retaining wall area and the boat shed on the side of the house. So obviously the you know garage portion would have been out on existing impervious ground on the driveway, but we would have had to add more to the boat shed on the side. So we did not utilize all of the predicted or expected, I guess, creation of impervious ground. So, and at least, you know, you guys are, I'm, I'm a physician. I have not anything related to this, but my understanding is that this shed or this playhouse, the only impervious ground that it's creating is the posts, if I'm not incorrect. And that's a pretty, you know, 1.8 square feet. I'm not sure if I'm accurate in that, but that's what I've been told from people who are more in tune with this than myself. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know if that's necessarily correct. I believe on the solar panel projects that we've been looking at, the solar panels are not considered impervious. Is that correct? Um, well, solar panels are actually exempt um, as being considered um, pervious under state guide guidelines. Under our local bylaw, however, the commission can consider them to be impervious. Yeah, I think that this is a relatively minor amount of impervious surface. I think that the whole project, you know, the, the reduction, my opinion is that the reduction of the garage impervious surface um and with uh, with i'm going to say four more blueberry bushes planted that are um accessible by wildlife is enough compensatory mitigation for this um this project i don't think i'm going to disagree with you Aaron a little bit i think a pool is way different than this uh there's way more impact from a pool this is literally four posts in the ground. And I'm 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 for presenting the you know a motion or something to say that we just accept this as a minor change, provided that Nathan, you plant four more blueberry bushes that are accessible by the wildlife. And the winterberry holly that was required in the original permit. And then once you're done, you close the permit out. I will do that. Thanks, Jason. Um, Alex. Yeah, first of all, I, I uh, Jason speaks my mind. And I just want to say that I was involved or present uh, for the swimming pool episode. And uh, I would side with Jason on that. Um, I appreciate Aaron bringing it up. But uh, 
I was fairly firm about my feelings about the swimming pool. And I don't think this is exactly the same. And I so I would like to see the mitigation straightened out, put in the ground, uh, having finished the playhouse. It's going to be where people build memories and have great time and uh, and move on. We got other things to do. Thanks, Alex. Uh, well, I was also present during uh, uh, during the pool um, discussions, and I do see the similarity in the issue of fairness uh, across the uh, uh, across applicants. Um, and speaking to all of you, I also see the 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 value of uh, uh, you know I. I I can't uh it the value of having um having such a, a cool spot for children to uh to learn and to uh, become you know become uh, advocates for uh, uh for wildlife or nature or uh for the environment um I you know at the same time uh being you know, weighing on the other end of it is, uh, you know, is the uh, uh, the violation uh, that's uh, that's occurred. Um, that having said all of that, um, I think it's a, a. I think that the uh, that it's not a huge uh, impact, and I would uh, I would agree to it being a minor administrative change. So. I think uh, unless we have any other comments, I think uh, we're ready for uh, for a motion. Do we have any comments first? Okay, looking for a motion. All right. I, is, there, uh... is there a motion that goes with this, uh, Aaron? <laughs> no, yes. I mean, it's, it's um, I think it's really, this is sort of informal. Um, so I, I think um, Jason kind of, summed it up pretty well in his comments. Um, it seemed, sounded like he was t teeing up to make a motion. So like, I think including the, um, you know, the mitigation that was required for the original project, and then any mitigation that you require for the, the proposed structure, um, you know, and, uh, you know. So, so now let, let's just kind of uh, get get this straight uh, because in my mind um i thought that originally there was uh there were blueberries were there blueberry bushes and um holly or was it one or the other have you been able to find that out yet Aaron, while we were talking um i did look back in the project folder and i wasn't able to um uh you know let me let me just check one more thing um it did look like the applicant might have some um more institutional memory about it than i do um but i will i'll check back too on the the um my presentation because usually i track what the motions are and what the requirements are a little bit more um for mitigation in those but it there was nothing in the project folder that that outlined it specifically. I'll, what I do remember was a co contribution to the in lieu fee fund. Um, so I wasn't sure. I we had discussed blueberries. I had blueberries in my institutional memory as the mitigation that was proposed. I I, I don't know if he changed from winterberry to blueberries or what. But I maybe the applicant can speak to that. I think we had five hundred dollars to the fund, and um, you know, and we talked about planting blueberries, and we also talked about removing the urban olive and putting the holly there. And I will be brutally honest in that the holly or the urban olive has not been removed, and um, I'm. I my neighbor to the north asked that we don't do that because it that protects their view. They don't want to look at my boat. But the uh, ho the hollies would probably do that. So I, I mean, I think 
the right thing to do here is just to agree to put the hollies there and to plant blueberries um, that are not covered by our nets. <laughs> Does that sound reasonable? It does sound reasonable. Okay. Yeah. Um, how many uh, how many hollies and how many uh, blueberries are we talking? Well, it's the original thing said nine hollies, so we mm -hmm. can do nine hollies and whatever many blueberry bushes you want me to put in. <laughs> I want. I got a question. Um, <laughs> what do you What do you think, Aaron, for the blueberries, or anybody? So Jason had proposed four. Um, I mean, I think compensating for the footprint of the structure, and you know what would you plant in the footprint of that structure realistically i think probably four plantings in the footprint of that structure without you know them all killing one another growing over each other um but just to compensate for that structure i think that would be a minimum correct would that be then four from the original plus four for the structure or or what are we talking about well i sorry i proposed four for the structure Plus the nine winterberry from the original uh, notice of intent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds yes. good to me. And I pulled up on the screen. This was the this was the original um, approval for thirty kestrel. So the five hundred dollar contribution to the wetland mitigation fund. Um, you make it larger. Yes. The removal of the autumn olive with spot treatment herbicide on the stems. Um, yeah. All right. Well, it looks to me like uh, like we're 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 gonna go with the nine and the four then. Um, Alex, was there something that you needed to that you wanted to uh, contribute? Yeah. Was Nate was the um. Uh, was the five hundred dollar contribution made? Yep. Yes. Yep. I can yep. confirm and, that. And how much room? Um, I mean, I know the site, but I when we went to look at the play the the structure that's at issue today, I didn't pay much attention to uh, what's between the lean to and the wetland. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out well, where's all the stuff going to get planted. And I presume it's between the lean to and the structure. And if that's true, how much room do we have? Uh, the, the, how much room we have is a limiting limiting factor. And you say your neighbor doesn't want to see your boat. So uh, um, um, I think I would propose I would propose we fill it up. So just to clarify, I, I just want to make sure I understand what Alex is saying. Alex, are you asking if there's room to plant the winter berries between the bottom of the retaining wall and the um, wetland buffer? Is that the question? Yeah, I'm just wondering how much space we've got. We're talking about, yeah. we're making decisions about the number of plants, and I'm wondering, well, where are they going to go? And is there room? Well, and And if your neighbor doesn't want to see your boat, then I would suggest we'd be robot. Uh, robust and and uh and generous with the plantings and use the mitigation um uh to create a visual barrier for your neighbor and benefit the wildlife yeah i don't i mean i think you know if you remove the urban the urban olive there there's you know room to certainly plant stuff i mean there's still about 20 feet between um the uh the retaining wall and the wetland marker um i guess my question would be or i'd ask for a plant that you'd recommend that would get at a reasonable height does winterberry get at a i don't i don't know these things so i would if i had a ask from you as the committee if there would be a plant that um gets tall or you know whatever 10 15 feet that would be probably 
better <laughs> than a ground cover. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, and then I just, before before Jason goes, I just had to uh, throw in another thing, and is and then we don't want the bear the the beavers to cut them all down, so I want to be careful not to uh, uh, um, put the plants at risk of of becoming beaver food. Otherwise, that we won't achieve what we're looking for. So, um, before I take my hand down, I know Michelle has recused herself but she's a plant person and if she could make some suggestions uh and still be recused um that would be helpful hey that's a good idea can we let jason go first yeah no i was just gonna say one i just looked up the winterberry holly on google here and it says it gets six to twelve feet tall yep. I'm rather bushy. Uh, so I don't, I, and, and, you know, we're trying to do this to protect the resource. I see the beavers as part of the resource. If the beavers end up coming in and eat the plants, you know, uh, is there really anything you can do about that? And should you be doing anything about it? If it's a native plant, we want it to be planted because it's native and then the natives come and eat it. Uh, you know, I don't think that there's a whole lot of issue uh, there for me personally, but where the winterberry is supposed to be planted according to the original plan is right next to the lean to. Right. Which is where I think that, I mean, so it's my assumption that that is where they'll go as far as the four blueberries. I would say plant them in my opinion, somewhere around the structure if you think they'll do well there and that's what you're compensating for and this whole project is to get your kids out in nature and if they can sit there and birds come around and eat the berries like i think that would be a great thing as long as the bears don't do it uh so i think that that would be a good i think those two areas are appropriate Sounds good. Um, I don't think that the beavers are going to really go for that. They're they like, as far as I see, they like bigger. They like trees, small pole, you know, pole sized trees and and other stuff like that. Willows at altars. Michelle, well, the beavers didn't take out the autumn olive, so they're there. I would also say that. Um, the autumn olive, I think if they're cut, they're going to need to be pulled out by the root. And I, I think that's actually kind of a substantial thing, which so I don't know, but we do have a landscape architect here. So maybe if he's on site, he could maybe come up with something that would be appropriate to the actual land. Um, hollies get big, but you'd have to buy them big um, and there'd be a lot of work taking out those autumn olives. So um, maybe putting them somewhere else on the perimeter of the property would be appropriate. I wouldn't squeeze them all in there, Alex, because they're just going to choke them out and then they won't be bushy and the neighbors will have to look at the boat and they probably would have some mortality. Um, not having been on the site really to look at it like this, I would, yeah, refer to the, the expert here. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a number of infill spots, you know, amongst the stuff that's along that edge for, for enough for those shrubs to fit into pretty easily without a lot of disturbance. Okay. All right, Bruce. I think we're trying to micro design this too much and that we should have let the consultant, the applicant and the staff figure these things out on, on site based on some principles that we have agreed to. That sounds good, Bruce. Um, so I think, I, I think we're, uh, let me just add one last uh, thing, Nathan, um, and that is that uh, we are uh, we you know once we're through with tonight, we are looking for at some point for you to close this out and to finish uh, uh, finish your uh, projects um, or project with the uh, administrative change, uh, please. And uh, I I think it is time for us to you know if we're gonna do. So I guess we're not we're gonna not gonna do a motion. Is that uh, where we're going with this now? 
I think there should be a motion. Okay. Um, but I think we should have some recommended, you know, mitigation requirements. I'm hmm. one one thought I had, and I'll just share this is is dogwood might be a good suggestion because dogwood can get um, higher. It has beautiful flowers on it. Um, it has nice um, uh, vegetation on it. So a couple dogwood trees might achieve what he's looking for. But I'm not saying that we if the commission doesn't want to require that as mitigation, it's just a you know suggestion that they might provide a nice buffer between in the wetland area between the um, the wetland and the boat. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great suggestion. Um... I think it would be. I think we've all uh, kind of agreed to uh, to go with the uh, nine, the nine hollies and the uh, four blueberries for now. Um, I, I think. I think. I think we could uh, use a motion at some point. Yeah, I'm wondering. Go ahead, Alex. We keep talking about four blueberries, and I think that was suggested for as mitigation for the play structure. But we've got the and maybe I'm wrong, but somebody said that they thought that was appropriate for the play structure. But we've also got the blueberries that were originally required, and they're in the garden setting in the backyard, and we're asking for them to be replaced. Keep the blueberries in the backyard. And and plant what was originally called for, uh, so that would be four plus what was ever originally called for. Yeah, and I don't think that I think when we were just reviewing things, we did not find where we had actually re required those four. Is that correct, Alan? Aaron? Well, then yeah. I would move. Then I would I would I would suggest that um, perhaps Nathan is willing to. Uh, keep his blueberries where they are and replace them uh, in addition to the four for the play structure. So we're talking about eight, uh, um, eight, eight blueberries, round it off to 10 for a round number and uh, then put in the other stuff. And so we could have a motion to provide guidelines that staff coordinate uh, and administrate. So the, the, the administrative change would be the staff uh, coordinate with the uh, the owner and uh, his consultant um, to um, decide where these things are going to go, and then arrange for the order to order of compliance to be put together. And and I assume that in order to close the order, the place structure has to be completed. All right, a quick show of hands of, of, among um, among us uh, commissioners. Uh, frankly, I, I think uh, he's, he's going to be running out of room. Um, I, I think four and four and nine is good with me. Um, meaning four blueberries, nine uh, of the Ollie's is okay with me. He also wrote um, that he was willing to put two hundred and fifty dollars toward the uh, uh, mitigation. Um, yeah, great. Fund as well. Sorry. And I, so I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alex. Just trying to. Just sorry. I I'll let you finish, but I was. I, I was confused that the 250 was and the 500 I I didn't put them together okay yeah no uh yeah uh so I think he uh, had originally uh proposed 500 and paid it and now he's uh, he's proposed uh, another 250 um but I do think that that's that's plenty and I think we've uh, uh we've massaged this quite a bit um I'm willing to go for go with uh, to limit go with just an extra four that uh, would compensate for the ones that he that uh, uh, Nathan and family are using for uh, their own harvest and, uh, plus the nine uh, hollies is just a show of hands 
who wants more than that or who is satisfied with that? I'm Which sorry. one are you asking? Who is satisfied with more? And yeah, all right. I'm satisfied. All right, all right, uh, Alex. I'm, uh, let's let's just propose that um, as the uh, in the as the. Can I ask Nathan how many he's got in his garden? How many blueberries does he have in his garden? We can't hear you, Nathan. You, you're you've got you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I just got some screaming going on. Um, uh, there's eight in the garden. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, so I would. I would propose that. That. Um, I'm not quite sure what the wildlife value is of the. Uh, of the other plants, but I would propose that he replace the eight in his in his garden for this project and whatever else you folks want, and uh, that um, Aaron get together with him and his consultant and put it together. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Jason. Yeah, I would. I mean, can I make a motion then that we just plant eight instead no. of 12 or 10? Just plant eight there. Nobody can seem to find any uh, actual reference to these blueberry plants in any kind of document. The nine we have, the nine winterberry we have in the original NOI. I would propose the motion to plant the nine winterberry, plant eight blueberry, and then once the structure is complete and the plantings are in place, the permit be closed. And that would that include the two hundred and fifty dollar additional addi contribution? No, I'm not proposing an additional contribution. He's already made a five hundred dollar contribution. I think with eight blueberries, nine winterberries, with the size of this structure, I think that that is sufficient. Okay. I second the motion. Okay. Uh, so we have Jason uh, with a motion and Bruce with a second. Um, Aaron, you got that uh, eight and nine? Yes. Nathan, are you good with that? Okay. I'm fine with that. So, yep. So now for a vote. Um, Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I'm an aye. Nathan, thank you very much for your patience. Thanks. Uh, what you're doing is wonderful, uh, having your girls out there and uh, enjoying and learning from nature. Um, wow. It's it's awesome. It was just the procedure was, uh, was a bit of an issue. I understand. Um, and uh, I thank you for, for working with me. Okay? Absolutely. All thank right, you. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to as well. sign off. Bye-bye. <clears throat> All right. Back, back to you, Michelle. Thanks, Andre. <clears throat> so um, I hadn't thought about this before, but maybe when we write those order of conditions that we somehow clarify what we consider to be minor activities, it, you know, in parentheses or something um, could be confusing when someone's reading their permit. And then um, I guess be more explicit about intentions for mitigation. <clears throat> um, anyway. I think that's it for the night. Yes. Any final public comment? Yeah. Raise your hand now. Nope. Okay. Yep. Go for it, Andre. Oh, I see someone up there. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I had a question about um, hunting on conservation land, and I don't know if this is the forum to ask it. I've tried to get an answer through email and have been unsuccessful. Great question, and it's actually being discussed in detail on our land use subcommittee meetings. Um, so currently it is allowed on conservation land following general Massachusetts guidelines, but I'm going to let maybe Dave or Aaron um, talk more about that. Oh, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I think your answer was was accurate, Michelle, I think right now it's allowed as per Massachusetts law. Um, 
but we are looking at the 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 historic policy. I will say that going back some years, there were some areas, this was hotly disputed in Amherst for many years prior to me coming on board working for the town. And uh, there were many public meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there were some areas that were uh, off limits to hunting. But I think we're we're trying to take a look at that for you know, the future and see whether this commission would like to you know, restrict hunting in any way or change any way we regulate the use of conservation land. We're also looking at fishing, trapping, and many other uses. So uh, to be determined, but I think right now it's uh, as per Massachusetts law. Thanks, Dave. Go ahead, Alex. Okay, okay. I, there um... is a... Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, go ahead, Scott, why don't you just follow up? Well, I was just going to say there is a, a website on the town. Town has a website about hunting. It does say that, um, you know, it gives a list of about eight or nine conservation lands where hunting is permitted. It says all other conservation areas are closed to hunting. So it sounds like that needs to be updated. Yeah, we, we can take a look at that. Um, many of those other areas are very small. So we do need to kind of keep in mind that, you know, we have conservation areas that are one acre and we have conservation areas that are 200 acres. So some of those may, I'll have my staff take a look at that. Aaron and I can take a look at that web page, but some of them are very small. So historically the commission, the previous commission might've said, we just don't feel as though a uh, hunting should be allowed on a two acre conservation area with abutting uh, trails or the rail trail or um, nearby houses. So that's, we'll, we'll take a look at that, Scott. Okay. Alex. Scott, that's a great question. Um, can I ask why you ask? Well, I um, I recently moved to Amherst. Um, our property backs up onto the Brickyard Conservation Area. Um, we saw quite a few number of hunters walking behind the house. I, you know, I looked it up on the town website. It suggested that there was, you know, hunting was not allowed in Brickyard. More recently, we've had a hunter that's driving on one of the recreational trails through the Brickyard and causing quite a bit of soil disturbance. I would think that that would not be permissible. Um, but I just I don't know all the, you know all the all the local, um, you know bylaws and rules. So, trying to get an answer. If you would be willing, in terms of the 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 folks driving anywhere out there, that would be helpful to have some more information. If you wanted to email. Aaron or myself on that. Were they riding on the driving on the rail trail or or on a dirt road back there? Um, they were driving on the Ken Cuddleback Trail. Um, we noticed, you know, just take just walking on the trail, noticed tire tracks and quite a bit of soil disturbance. And it just doesn't. I'm a biologist, so you know, trails, are, you know, can be a source of disturbance to wildlife and, you know, vectors for invasive plants. And it just seemed like, you know, that probably wasn't allowed. Um, you know, the town having to come in and rehabil rehabilitate trails that have been all torn up by trucks was probably not in the budget, um, but I didn't know. So, and I don't know what the enforcement action is, you know, if this is you know, if I see somebody doing that sort of thing and who am I supposed to call or what am I supposed to do? Yeah, certainly report it to the conservation. You could send it to Aaron or myself or Brad Borderweek, our land manager. All of us have emails on the town website or there's a general conservation um, email. Um, but I'm wondering if um, I, I'm thinking of a location which is, which is near... Uh, <laughs> Kestrel Lane and and that area, and I'm wondering if if it might be someone going in through that area. I do know there may be one secure unsecured area there where somebody could drive in, but 
that's from the east going west to Brickyard, but I'm not aware of anybody, an easy way to get in from the west. But please email us with any of that information where you saw tire tracks and we can do a little research on that. Okay, great, thank you. And Scott, you can you can also you can always call the police too if uh, if you think someone is violating the law. Okay. Uh, there, I'll say that um, there's a there's a uh, trail. You know, just so you keep this in mind, uh, there is uh, there are some trails that have um, rights of way for people to access. Uh, so if you're to access to do their farming. Um, for example, if you're accessing the trail off of Southeast Street that uh, goes toward um, Brookfield Farm, um, people use that, they'll drive down that road to, uh, uh, to get to their uh, cattle and to uh, get to the fields over there. So I'm not sure if that's, and I, and I have seen, by the way, a vehicle drive back in there uh, to and park there to to hunt and they're parking on the property of uh, that landowner there that adjacent landowner yeah it's a good point andre many many of our trails are actually on private property where we are the guests and so there are some shared use pathways farm roads woods roads where 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 you know as we walk the public walks or runs or bird watches or whatever we're actually on private property and there is a shared use uh, agreement for farm vehicles. And then of course, conservation vehicles often are going down those uh, trails, uh, old roads, et cetera, to do maintenance or uh, do mowing or, or fix bridges or whatever. Yeah, so more information would be great. Anything you can send us, Scott, would be very much appreciated. Okay. Um, if you're curious about what land is what and who owns by who um, and your new mass mapper or the Amherst mapping, you can look at the plot lines and, um, you know, maybe if that road is on private property or just provide some clarity. It's okay, I will look at that. I mean, it's a it's a walking, hiking trail. Okay. You had to, you know, drive up over the sidewalk to get onto the trail with this truck and drove back ways, parked. You know, I think he's hunting, I'm guessing he's hunting ducks back in the wetlands that are on the other side of the railroad track and didn't want to have to walk as far. That's my guess, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it again. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost positive I know where this spot is, Scott, and we've been talking about gating it. I was in there as recently as last fall in October and November, and we've been talking about gating it. And if people wanted to, they'd need to park on the road and walk back into Brickyard. So I'm pretty sure I know exactly where you're talking about going up over the over the curb and then getting back into the woods there. So we will that's definitely on our list to, to potentially put in a gate or a cable uh, to keep anyone but um, town staff out of there. Okay. And, except if Thank they you. want. Except if they walked, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, can I just clarify the hunting on Amherst Conservation Land is only permitted Lawrence Swamp, Holyoke Range, Atkins Flat, East of Brook only, Simmons Farm, Eastman Brook, Catherine Cole, Hoddock, Houston slash Gage located in Shootsbury. So Brickyard is not listed there. It says all other town of Amherst conservation areas are closed to hunting. So if someone's hunting in Brickyard, it sounds like they should not be doing that. I think that is accurate, Jason, but I will say our committee is looking at all of that right now. The other issue is just enforcement, the challenge of, you know, people, hunters included, uh, will walk in and enter and hunt just like we have you know hundreds of people every month walking dogs off leash on all of our trails so the challenge is really enforcement yeah i would i would favor enforcement of the the, the off leash dogs don't have firearms right but they do do a, they do have a great impact out on those trails so I, it's just the point about enforcement is challenging yeah 
so just to piggyback on the conversation, state law requires that if land is not open to hunting, that the landowner post it. Um, and so that is also the challenge, um, is that any land that we say is closed to hunting, we have to adequately post as no hunting um, and maintain the, that signage, which I don't believe has historically been done. So Actually, Aaron, it has been. Historically, oh, has it? it has been, yeah. We've done oh. it for years. Really? I think uh, I think it's waned in the last few years, but yeah, we've, oh. it's, it's actually quite a, Quite an endeavor to to post all of the other areas that are off limits to hunting, but we do it on the trailheads. But um, I think it's all in flux right now, given that we're considering all of this with this subcommittee on land use. Yeah, and Scott, if you want to submit public comment, that's always valuable because we are in the midst of revising it and thinking about it. So we always like to hear about people's experiences and thoughts on it. But I think everybody kind of gave you as much as we know and maybe calling the cops next time if there's no hunting. Although it's not posted, right? So I guess that's sticky. Never mind. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else, Scott, anybody, I think we're ready to call it a night. I move to adjourn. Second. Andre on the motion. Alex on the second. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks, Scott, for showing up and sitting through. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Good night, Thank everyone. Good night. Michelle. Yeah. I'll talk to you after. Uh...